The Capital Investment Committee here for March 17 is called to order. We do not have a quorum, and so we're going to move straight to a bill presentation. Members, these bills will be heard on an informational basis only with five minutes allotted for the member and one testifier with one additional uh, public testifier for technical support. So first up, we have two bills from Representative Feist, House File 740. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, and I don't actually have the bill number memorized, but I assume House File 740 is for Corner House and not New Brighton. Fabulous. Um, so Corner House um, is a nationally accredited, accredited children's advocacy center with a 30 plus year of history of creating and training on evidence-based practices. Um, I'm going to let uh, Mitzi Hobart, the executive director, tell you more, but I will say that I toured their current location and it is very small <laughs> and um, they could do with a lot more square footage and that's why we are here today. So I will turn it over to my testifier. Welcome, Director. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair. My name is Mitzi Hobot. I'm the Executive Director of Corner House. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Feist, for um, that introduction. And thank you, Chair, for having us here today. We're, I am incredibly excited to be here. Um, as Representative Feist said, Corner House is a nationally accredited children's advocacy center providing critical response services for very brave children who have witnessed violence or disclosed abuse. We bring together a team of multidisciplinary partners into our space to hear a child's experience, create individualized supports to immediately begin helping these children with advocacy and mental health services, and our partners work to determine next steps in their investigations. By integrating best practices tested over three decades that include trauma-informed, language-accessible services for children speaking Spanish, Hmong, Somali, and Russian, Families supported by Corner House are much less likely to have, have a recurring incident of maltreatment. Children's trauma symptoms are identified, services are escalated as needed, and ongoing specialized mental health therapies result in an improved well-being. Parents have the knowledge and the skills they need to provide a safe and supportive home, all of which improves school readiness, school performance, and since 40% of the children we support are adolescents, already engaged in or about to enter the workforce, our support fosters successful transition to employment. These children deserve a trauma-informed space that is physically and psychologically safe with which to participate in a forensic interview, a trauma or a suicidality screening, to receive immediate family support and advocacy services and individual and group therapy. Not only is Corner House an incredible resource for Hennepin County, but you'll notice from our state map that we, st we support children from across the state. And although the Corner House is a significant resource providing direct services for children and families, We've also been a pioneer in the field by building an evidence-based forensic interview protocol and training. We provide training and technical assistance for thousands of law enforcement and child protection professionals across Minnesota, the United States, and globally, most notably in Japan and Trinidad. And in just last, the last five months, we've hosted training for 60 Hennepin County child protection professionals and are in the middle of training 100 from Ramsey County with Douglas County training occurring in the near future. By supporting this project, you're investing in a training center that improves services across the field or services across the state to better support the child victims and now and into the future. Corner House has spent the last two years completing our pre-design work with a project team from Cushman Wakefield and Pope Architects to complete our program and our space plans. We are actively negotiating for the purchase of a building and are asking this committee in the state of Minnesota to support this project. Investment in this capital project will have immediate impact. By doubling our forensic interview rooms, we can respond to 300 more children per year without hiring another uh, employee. The build out of the training rooms means we can train many more law enforcement officers and child protection professionals to improve investigations. These rooms serve as dual purpose and double as group therapy and community events in the evening, supporting thousands of families per year. This location improves our ability to host evening therapy appointments for children who are in school during the day and the space allows us to expand our geographic range. We're not just shooting to serve a single community here, but instead working to build an integrated system. Corner House isn't merely asking for our capital cash investment in this project, but instead we see this as a pivotal project investing in a solution for families cycling in and out of child protection and a solution for children who have been impacted by trauma to recover and thrive simply by expanding our space. This project is ready. We're incredibly excited that we have found an incredible building, and we couldn't be more excited and honored to expand such important work. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Representative Fox, can I have you uh, quickly describe the DE2 amendment for us? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the original building that was in the original version of this bill um, is no longer the building that Corner House is looking at. And so we expanded it to allow for one of a number of buildings that they are currently um, 
in negotiations yes. for. Thank you. Representative Carroll. Thank you, uh, Chair. And uh, let me just thank uh, Representative Feist for bringing this bill. Uh, I'm familiar with Corner House with my work at the Hennepin County Attorney's Office. It's an important asset. It's an important service that is being provided. So thank you for doing that. Representative Feist, any closing comments? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to hear us today. Um, Corner House is really special. They're an important partner to law enforcement, to the community. They also have very specialized facilities. Um, those forensic interview rooms are really interesting um, and how they're interconnected. And also they, they have to provide a really deliberative space um, to meet the needs of the children that they serve. Um, so I am really honored to be working with them on this request and thank you for hearing it today. Thank you, Representative Feist. Next on the agenda, House File 1516, Representative Feist, please proceed. Great, thank you. Um, so this is a project for the city of New Brighton and uh, Devin here is the city manager. So I'll, I'll just be really brief and then turn it over to him. Uh, this request has been around for many years. Um, it is a request from the city of New Brighton. The materials uh, that you have are very, very specific. Um, this is a project that's already underway to the extent that it can be, um, but this funding will really enable um, the city of New Brighton to, to really um, aggressively move this project, which is going to significantly increase the quality of life for not just New Brighton, but surrounding communities. Um, and I will let Devin provide the technical details. Please identify yourself and proceed. My name is Devin Masselpost. I serve as the city manager for the city of New Brighton. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for your time and having me here today. I really appreciate it. New Brighton is a seven square mile city in the North Metro. Before it became what it is today, which is a thriving community with great parks and schools and over 23,000 people, was home to stockyards, pole yards, packing houses, and ice houses. These uses were the result of and necessitated the extensive use of railroads. Because of this, our seven square mile city is now home to 12 at grade rail crossings. This historical issue has become a serious quality of life concern due to frequent and disrupting noise of train horns, as well as a safety concern for residents of not only New Brighton, but also the surrounding communities of Moundsview, Fridley, Arden Hills, Roseville, St. Anthony, and Columbia Heights. As a city, we've been working to solve this local and regional issue, and we are requesting the state's assistance in helping us achieve it. To ensure a high quality of life and safety for pedestrians, vehicles, and trains alike, we're working towards creating quiet zones around the rail crossings. Generally, a quiet zone is a change to the built environment and infrastructure that makes it so trains do not have to blow their horns when they pass through a crossing. The Federal Rail Authority has set rules that require horns to be blown for a certain amount of time and distance. Once improvements to the crossings have been made, the FRA can grant exemptions to these areas, thus creating a quiet zone which we are trying to achieve. Today, the northernmost crossing in New Brighton impacts over 12,000 people in the cities of New Brighton, Fridley, and Moundsview, and the southernmost crossing impacts over 8,000 people in New Brighton, Roseville, and St. Anthony. Quiet zone infrastructure is imperative for the safety of pedestrians and vehicles, but rail safety generally in our community. Additionally, the infrastructure helps ensure a high quality of life for the residents of New Brighton, but also our surrounding communities. Thank you very, very much for your time and consideration, and thank you for all that you do for communities across Minnesota. Thank you. So Representative Fies, I see that you have language in here not requiring a non-state match. Is the city able to provide a match in a, what amount? Right now, uh, that's not the way it's been proposed. We have spent over $600,000 over the last two to three years uh, working on some of these areas, but to fulfill the requirement, uh, we're requesting the state's assistance. And so you are requesting the full amount or can you do 50% of the requested amount? Right now, we're requesting the full 2.6 million. And the project can't move forward if you don't get the full amount from the state? Right now, we've been doing it piecemeal as we're able to through our both regional partners and grant funding. Uh, but this is another, we've requested this three to four times in the past and doing so again as we work to uh, allow ourselves to do it fully if we can. But right now, we're not able to do so. Thank you. No other questions. Okay, thank you. Next on the agenda, House file. Nine seventy four, Chair Moeller. Thank 
Yes, Kim, you ruined my system. <laughs> the bill author is not here, Chair uh, Representative Erdahl. Right. Chair Muller, uh, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. So the city of Shoreview, along with the city of Arden Hills and North Oaks, is seeking funding for 50% of the construction costs of a new headquarters fire station in order to continue to serve multiple jurisdictions through the Lake Johanna Fire Department. The Lake Johanna Fire Department operates out of three stations over a 31 square mile primary service area serving Arden Hills, North Oak, Shoreview, and the Arden Hills Army training site, which is occupied and used by the National Guard. The department has served the cities in the region for, since 1943. It also provides service to regional travelers along Interstate Highways 35, W694, multiple highways, and serves portions of seven adjacent cities through automatic response agreements for structure fires and an additional 38 square miles provides mutual aid and is a member of the North Suburban Hazmat team. This project will provide a new headquarters fire station. It will be utilized by multiple regional partner agencies. And the station has been designed to meet the needs of the regional service area for the next 50 years. It will also include um, in, in our area future development of over 427 acres in Arden Hills, as well as additional higher density growth in the city of Shoreview and infill development in North Oaks. I'll just note too, in our area, we have a lot of um, senior living facilities that have recently been built and are, are currently in the process of being built. This is all in addition to the annual call volume of over 4,000 calls, which has increased by an average of 8.5% annually since 2013. The need for this station was determined in 2018 through a study of the department's current and future needs in the regional area. Um, the city concluded that the, the south station is deficient due to many different factors, one of which it's right on a rail line, and I can attest to being stuck with it while that trade is going by. It's a really bad spot for the current station. So the new site was identified and acquired, will allow for improved access for emergency vehicles and improved response times in the service area. Um, in addition, the station will provide enhanced health and safety equipment, and in, uh, in closing, funding is needed for the station in order to continue providing effective and efficient life-saving fire, rescue, and emergency medical services to the multi-city region and to meet the needs in the service area for decades to come. And then the two people with me here are just here for the chief and the mayor for any questions that I can't answer. Members, any questions for Representative Erdahl? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And the moment, just to get this straight. We're building a fire hall. Chair Muller. So, uh, yeah, it's a fire station, yeah. Okay. Right, just build clarity for us. <laughs> See, no other questions. Thank you, Chair Muller. Any uh, quick closing comments? Yeah, I'll just say, members, there's also in your packets um, a letter talks a little bit more about the specific number of calls they've had in the area, um, and then also precisely what this new headquarters fire station um, will cover and really look forward to your support. Thank you. So next on the agenda, we have House File 959. Uh, Representative Kwam is presenting on behalf of Representative Davids. Welcome, Representative Kwan. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a historic district that in the mid-1800s, it was a thriving community, and a majority of the uh, adult men in the community and in the area volunteered to fight in the Civil War. They had huge casualties, and the, uh, the community, it took them many decades to recover. This is used for schools and the area to commemorate uh, events and to teach history. Um, the idea here is to have funds to preserve. The seminary is part of the site. There's also the only uh, Civil War induction center east of the Mississippi that's been restored as part of the site. So the idea is to have this as a historic site to remind us of the dedication and the history that this area and Minnesota gave 
in the Civil War. Thank you, Representative Quams. See, no, uh, Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd kick him out. And uh, Mr. Representative Quam, thank you for this presentation. I just wanted to note that if people want to know more about Wasiloj, uh, I, I did write about it in one of my books. So if you want to know about that, uh, I won't advertise and just ask me. <laughs> Representative Quam, any closing comments? Just uh, thank you for the consideration and remembering our history is a uh, good lesson for our youth and us. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Kwam. So next on the agenda, House File 920, Representative Kreisha. Welcome, Representative Kreisha. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. And I'm actually going to turn this over to my testifier right away. I want to give them as much time. Director, please identify yourself and proceed. Uh, good afternoon. Randall Dietrich, Director of the Minnesota Military and Veterans Museum at Camp Ripley. Uh, Chairman Lee, thank you for Amendment 23. House File 670 to 5.7 million for the new museum would be a significant down payment and the 23 million needed to construct this important facility in the heart of Minnesota. We also appreciate the committee members who have signed on to the bill, Representative Hussein, Lilly, and Wolgamot. The scope of this project has not changed since we received initial funding. Our current need to move the facility is based on an FAA directive to seek a new facility um, from our current Camp Ripley site, uh, which is directly across the street from a busy airfield. A more suitable 32-acre site between the Veterans Cemetery and Highway 371 has been secured. And while the scope has remained unchanged since before the pandemic, the cost of construction has not. We did seek to remedy this last year, but no bonding bill was passed. In the interim, our state approved and appointed architect, HGA, completed the formal design development phase necessary to arrive at an exact cost price for construction. The Minnesota Department of Military Affairs concurs with these needs for additional funds and will oversee construction, manage day-to-day -day operations, and complete ongoing maintenance. Military Affairs and the Department of Veteran Affairs are both backers of this project, along with the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, the JCRC, Commander's Task Force, and many others. With HGA's design work now done, and with your help now, we are prepared to break ground this summer and open to the public in the summer of 2025. For a minute, let me share with you some of our collective history that will be showcased in this new facility. Just a few years after statehood in 1858, Minnesotans, by the thousands, marched off to fight in a battle that would ultimately free 4.2 million enslaved people. Our veterans of the Spanish-American War and World War I formed the VFW and American Legion, respectively, two organizations who have contributed so much over the last century. In the closing days of World War II, Minnesota soldiers who, fought, who thought they'd seen everything up through 1945 were mistaken when they encountered and liberated concentration camps. And as many of you know, Earlier this week, 99-year-old Holocaust survivor, Dora Zeidenweber, testified here in the state capitol. We have to keep these stories alive, and these are the stories that will be on permanent display in our museum. Many of our veterans from World War II were called upon to serve in Korea, including General John W. Vesey, among other Minnesotans. General Vesey's gravesite and thousands of others are at the Veteran State Cemetery directly across from this new facility a legacy of the Vietnam War, to be on permanent display in the museum are the incredible allies that fought alongside American forces and how Minnesota came to be home to the vibrant Hmong community. On September 11, 2001, and every day since, Minnesotans have served with distinction, including Major Katie Lunning, who received the Distinguished Flying Cross just three months ago for her tireless work in the evacuation at Hamid Karzai International Airport in Kabul, Afghanistan. In closing, I'll draw your attention to page two of your handouts from our museum, and specifically the materials and statement from Adjutant General Sean Mankey. 
Military Affairs concurs with the revised cost estimate of the construction of the museum requiring $23.7 million either in cash or in additional bond proceeds. He goes on to state, we are in the process of investing in a generational resource that will serve Minnesotans in an ideal location with an important mission. Though we are experiencing unprecedented construction costs increases that necessitates the request for this and additional funding, we're also in a time of equally unprecedented circumstances that have made an investment of this scale feasible. Thank you, Chairman. Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam. <laughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Representative Krisha, uh, appreciate bringing this bill forward. Uh, w wasn't there also a safety concern uh, regarding the runway? Or the, uh, you amplify on that a little bit, please? Director. Mm, thank you, Chairman Lee. I'd be happy to. Uh, Representative Erdahl, yes, uh, the FAA has instructed that we move from our current location where we've been for 40 years. Uh, right now, the current location on Camp Ripley is directly across from a very busy airfield. So uh, we, we're not choosing to move. We have to move. Uh, we secured this additional land. We've completed the design. And with their help, we'll break ground this summer. And Mr. Chair, just a, a, a quick uh, follow up on that. So a couple of things. The uh, the airstrip is also the instrument landing approach, which is the precision landing approach for the camp. We actually had a situation a couple years ago where a helicopter came in in dense fog and was off by 200 yards, which put them landing right over the crowds. And so we have precision aircraft coming, or we have aircrafts coming in on precision flight path, uh, paths and right over this. In fact, I know the military museum can only have a certain amount of people there if they start getting active and bringing some of the big uh, aircraft in. So it is a concern. And the other safety concern is by moving this out of the encampment, uh, they actually will be able to have visitors register outside and all that. So they'll be able to control what goes in and out of the gates. Thank you, Representative Kresha. I'll take that as your closing comments. Next on the agenda, House File 616, Representative Kresha. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And just quickly before I bring my test fire in, I just want to thank Ms. Nash. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell your staff how they do a great job. So I do have a test fire online, and I'm not sure how to bring her in. Okay. So we have uh, Mr. the Chief, board president. I'm Please identify yourself and proceed. Camille Warzeka. I'm Morrison County Historical Society board president. Morrison County Historical Society, organized in 1936 by a membership that elects its board of directors, is a private nonprofit which operates the Charles A. Weyerhaeuser Memorial Museum, located in Little Falls, Minnesota. We are on South Lindbergh Drive, the Great River Road, just north of the Pike Creek Bridge across the street from the Lindbergh State Park and south of the Lindbergh Home. It's an idyllic natural setting that is deeply important to Native people. The museum building was designed by noted architect Foster Dunwoody, one of the founders of Miller Dunwoody, which worked on the cap state capital res restoration projects. Built as a memorial to Charles A. Weyerhaeuser in 1975, it was designed to house and share the history of Morrison County. The building is in need of all the repairs and upkeep that come with a soon to be 50 year old building, but our biggest concern is the erosion to our Mississippi River Bank. Massive rain events in 2015, then again in 2020, have caused major parts of the bank to fall into the river, along with many mature trees. One of the corners of our museum building is only 20 feet from the edge of the bank. With 365 feet of exposed river bank dumping huge amounts of sediment into the Mississippi, it has to be affecting drinking water at St. Cloud, the first city to take its drinking water from the Mississippi, as well as destroying the habitat for many species of fish. We've been working on funding for the repair and stabilization of the river bank since 2015 event, working with Morrison County Soil and Water to find a solution with their direction, putting in a berm along the bank to divert water as a short-term measure. In March of 2022, with the help of the city of Little Falls, Morrison County commissioners we were able to hire Ed, an engineering company to develop a design plan to repair and stabilize the bank and provide habitat structure at the river's edge. We have a shovel ready, environmentally friendly plan ready to go when our bill is successful. 
Bids on the job repairing 365 feet of Mississippi River Bank will be advertised and we expect local companies will be eligible to do the work required. We need your support in getting our bonding bill HF 616 passed. An appropriation from the state legislature would help us stabilize the river bank, stop degrading drinking water downstream, and safeguard the capacity of the Weyerhaeuser Museum to preserve Morrison County history into the future. In your packet, you will find three letters of support that reflect our relationship with the community, documents giving more information on the museum building, collections, financials, erosion photos, and our shovel design, ready design plan with an opinion of probable construction costs. I'm hands, happy to answer any questions now, or you can contact me through Representative Cresha. And thank you for considering this investment in Morrison County history infrastructure. So President Warzek, uh, the uh, bill has an amount of 1.567 million, but the handout says 1.561 million. And so which one is it, or Representative Cresha? Always higher, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> I, it would be the fifty, uh, the one point five six seven. Six seven in the bill. That's correct. Okay. Uh, seeing no other questions, thank you, Representative Krisha. Thank you very much. Next on the agenda, you. House File three three eight, Representative Sister Mura. Welcome, Representative. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee, uh, Vice, Vice Chair Ryer, and members of the committee. My name is Samantha Sensumura. I'm the State Representative for District 63A in South Minneapolis. Thank you for hearing House File 338 and for bringing the Capital Investment Committee in the past to tour the facility that we'll be talking about today. This will, bill would provide funding to the Indian Health Board for the purpose of constructing a new medical facility in my district in South Minneapolis. The Indian Health Board provides primary medical, dental, uh, uh, medical, mental, and behavioral health and dental care for American Indians and Alaska Natives who reside in the metro area. IHB serves thousands of patients annually, and their existing facilities are not currently meeting the needs and the demands of the community. Seven out of ten American Indians and Alaska Natives reside in urban settings, oftentimes because of government policies, lack of economic opportunities elsewhere, or limited access to health care and other services. IHB is providing critical care and services to so many, and an expansion with our help will increase their patient visit capacity by 38%. Finally, I want to thank Governor Walls for specifically including this project with the Indian Health Board in his 2022 bonding recommendations. It is an extremely worthy project, um, and I just want to say as the author of this bill and as the representative from this district, um, this is a, a part of our district that is really in need of some positive development right now. Um, it's a part of our district where a lot of businesses have closed down. A lot of businesses are really struggling to come back from the pandemic. Um, there's a Taco Bell across the street that was kind of one of the only businesses that was thriving on the specific block that recently closed down. Um, and so I got to visit um, and see the plans for, for this future facility, which includes a really beautiful garden space. Um, and I think it would just be an incredibly important development for my community. Um, and with that, I would like to turn things over to my testifier, the Indian Health Board's medical director and CEO, Dr. Patrick Rock. Uh, Representative Sister Moore, before the... Uh Director, oh, proceed. Yes. Can you explain the A1 amendment quickly? Yes. Um, sorry. Uh, the A1 amendment, um, it gets the bill in the shape that I would like it. Um, it takes out the dental language um, from the bill, and I believe my testifier could speak more to why we made that change. Dr. Rock, welcome, and please proceed. Thank you very much, Chair Lee and members. Uh, thank you for hearing this bill for the Indian Health Board, and thank you for uh, touring the facility as part of our uh, your 2021 bonding tour. My name is Dr. Patrick Rock. I'm a family physician and CEO uh, of the Indian Health Board. I'm also an enrolled member of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. I came to the Indian Health Board nearly 27 years ago under the service obligation with the Indian Health Service as a primary care provider. I, I honestly thought I was going to uh, practice at my home reservation clinic and hospital until I found out about the Indian Health Board and uh, what this community faced. Uh, urban Indian health organizations and communities are often marginalized even within their own systems. IHB has no access to IH, IHS facility budgets, and that is why I'm here today. We are asking for the state's uh, partnership in helping us to construct a new medical uh, center, the third phase of our plan to create a wellness campus, or as we call Minandewiwe, a place where healing happens. An investment of $4 million by the state will leverage $11.1 million 
with other funding, uh, with other funding, including a 5.9 in federal funding and 5.2 million in IHB and investor equity. It would also allow us to increase our capacity to serve 38% more patients uh, than we currently can. Urban Indians deserve quality health care that respects culture, history, and tradition, and we ask for your help in fulfilling that mission. I thank Chair Lee and committee for your consideration and would be happy to answer any questions. Representative Erdahl. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, is this, uh, Representative, wh why did the, why was dental taken off? Yeah. Dr. Rock? Sure. We, we, we ended up rephasing our, our programming. So we're actually we're covering the uh, move to dental into another uh, phase. So be, that's our phase two, and we're covering that ourselves right now. So we need help with our medical facility, uh, basically, just to keep the program and, and progress moving forward. Since, of course, uh, bonding didn't occur last year, we want to make sure that our, our, our uh, phasing, et cetera, kept, uh, kept on schedule. Representative Erdahl. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so we anticipate in a future bonding request the dental facility? Uh, Dr. Rock? No, we do not. Right now, we, we anticipate just it being a medical facility uh, that we're in front of you today. We're actually in the middle of uh, uh, with, uh, with working with our architectural firm in the, uh, some of you probably seen the, the facility that we were at in the 2020 building is where we anticipate the dental facility moving to right now. Representative Erdahl. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, just so I have this straight, uh, I think I've been there a couple of times. This is, one of, is this on Franklin? Dr. This, Rock. Yes, sir. This is on Franklin, right across the street from actually the Taco Bell. So it's the larger um, campus uh, facility that we, we had shown you. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned Taco Bell helps me put it all in. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Rock. Just so we're all clear, you said that the dental piece was included in phase two, which you're undergoing right now currently. That's correct, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any closing comments, Representative Sister Moore? No, nope. uh, I think this is a great project. I think it would be extremely beneficial to the community. The Taco Bell that we're talking about is gone, so we need something positive in the neighborhood, and I think this is what we need. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Next on the agenda, House File 2646, Representative Smith. Welcome and please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee for hearing uh, this bill. House file 2646 is a bill that would provide state funding uh, for development of a heating and cooling energy distribution system for buildings in Rochester. As I mentioned earlier this week, Rochester is the second largest uh, metro area in the state. We are the only um, city outside of the metro that has over 100,000 residents, um, and we are growing rapidly. Um, and a lot of our services are regional. And this uh, bill would help uh, us be more energy efficient in a lot of those regional assets like the Mayo Civic Center, Rochester City Hall, Rochester Art Center, uh, Rochester Civic Theater, and the Rochester Public Library, which is a top 10 library in the country, I always like to say. Um, a key part of this project is the renewable energy uh, sources components, particularly geothermal around the downtown and replacement of building controls to key public buildings that again serve the entire region as well as the residents of Rochester itself. I think this is a great example of the priorities of the state, the legislature, um, and our city, and this committee specifically aligning really well. So um, thankfully, again, I have uh, Mayor Kim Norton who's able to join us virtually to tell you guys a little bit more about the project. Mayor Norton, welcome back. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee, Representative Smith, and committee. It's great to see you all again. My name is Kim Norton. I'm Mayor of the City of Rochester, for the record. This bill is especially near and dear to my heart. It's for a municipal district heating and cooling energy system. Some members may recall that this project was heard last year in the Climate and Energy Committee, and we're pleased that it's in the governor's bill. This project is seizing on an opportunity we have to build um, kind of breaking away from old technology, uh, being forward thinking and using uh, renewable energy. <laughs> this project is urgent. 
Uh, we were recently informed that the current steam line of heating and cooling for our building in this portion of um, the, the district uh, energy that we currently have is ending its useful life. We, it will be uh, turned off in 2023. If you visit Rochester and see steam escaping out of uh, the manhole covers, that is because there is leaking. And in fact, this week, uh, yesterday, we had to shut off the heating and cooling in the whole city hall uh, while repairs, emergency repairs were done. Um, at its core, this project provides a much more efficient way to heat and cool the buildings. As was said, it will be using geothermal and it sets the stage for more renewables in the future. This is a 50 year investment. The city of Rochester, some of you may or may not know, adopted the energy goals of 50% reduction of greenhouse gases by 2030 and 100% reduction by 2050. Our municipal utility also has a city council approved goal of 100% renewable by 2030. And this project fits right along with those efforts. This project also hits on the triple bottom line that I'm sure you've heard of, providing economic, environmental, and social benefits to our community and the state. It would result in our city hall being net zero by 2030. This project is scalable and adaptable to implement advanced renewable energy technologies, such as geothermal, but also the potential for solar PV or other emerging technologies if additional funding is secured. It builds on best pra practices, proven technologies, and there are adjacent properties to uh, the city facilities that you heard about that this could be uh, set up to. So we create a true district energy system and that's what we're looking for with this funding. Uh, we will have lower en energy costs in the future for future tenants, including um, city, but also others, including affordable living uh, areas that are being developed along this area. Lastly, we wanna uh, share a commitment to share information with other cities and entities who might be looking to use geothermal uh, district energy in the future. We really uh, would appreciate your uh, support and I uh, humbly ask for that here and I'm ha happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, moving forward. Thank you, Mayor. And then I don't know if Mayor or Representative Smith, so paragraph C talks about reimbursement. Is there any expectation that the amount that we have will be used for reimbursement or no? Do you want me to answer that? Or your... We have Heather here, and I think she can answer. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Heather Corcoran, Legislative Affairs and Policy Director for the City of Rochester. And this project is unique in that, um, as the mayor said, we were kind of forced to continue and move forward with the project, regardless of the um, state action last year related to the bonding bill. And so we do have um, bids currently out and accepted on this project. And so the city has expended funds on it already. Um, as the mayor said, it's scalable. And so additional state support and funding towards um, this project can help us scale up and um, would also, you know, t relate to the, the funds we've already expended toward the, the initial build out. But the amount in the bill would not be used for reimbursement or is it going to be used for reimbursement? Um, Mr. Chair, the... <laughs> Go ahead, Mayor. Well, I would just say the city will have an investment into this as well. So, uh, you know, some funds will be used uh, for the current project as it stands. The rest of them will be used to create a true district energy system. So uh, let me clarify my question. So the 18.96, how much of that is for reimbursement? Reimbursement is now a qualified uh, capital expense. And even though this is a general fund request, it is my intention to try to limit any reimbursement, any potential bill that we have. And so if you could clarify the 18.960, how much is for reimbursement or if the 18.960 is going to, towards uh, the project? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think um, that might get ahead of my skis, I guess, with our project manager might be the best person to answer that so we can <coughs> share that information with the committee. Okay, um, thank and do you. And at another time. I see another question to close the comments. Representative Smith. I don't think I have much to add. Uh, thank you to our mayor, who you probably noticed is doing this while having to travel to Chicago. So thank you for being here, Mayor, and uh, look forward uh, to other presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Next of the agenda, Representative Petersburg, House File 987. Welcome, Representative. Please proceed. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. You moved right along. You're ahead of schedule. Uh, congratulations. Uh, thank you for hearing this bill. Uh, this bill is for a $50,000 request for a memorial, a veterans memorial. And I do have a testifier online, but just briefly, I want to say the bill itself talks about it being at the Steel County Fairgrounds, which is true. Uh, right next, part of the uh, fairgrounds is the Historical Society, and that Historical Society is actually where it's going to be housed. And so, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Lori Arnold if she can get on. Ms. Arno, welcome. Please identify yourself and proceed. Yes, I am mm -hmm. Lori Arnold. I am uh, part of the Moonlighters Exchange Club here in Oatana. I'm their treasurer, and we are spearheading the Oatana Veterans Memorial. It has been uh, over seven years when we started this project, and uh, the, the hardest part was finding a place to have it. Um, last summer, we did secure a spot next to the Steel County History Center, which is a perfect spot, we think. And our uh, goal has been to raise, our initial goal was to raise 300,000 for this project. Um, and we just went over that last week with a, a great donation from one of the churches that was sold here in Otana. So that was great. We have broken ground on the site, but crept. And we have the granite uh, ordered uh, for the columns, and if you can see behind me, there is a rendering of our Otana Veterans Memorial uh, project. Uh, we are a small exchange group. We only have 15 members in our group, so we're pretty proud of the fact that we have raised over 300000 so far towards this project. And as all projects, uh, we've had unexpected expenses, and uh, things are a little higher priced after COVID. So we still move forward and would so appreciate, appreciate a donation of the $50,000. Thank you, Ms. Arno. Seeing no uh, questions, closing comments, Representative Petersburg. Uh, uh, thank you. And so as, as you heard, they've been done a good job of raising the funds, but they're still short and needing this money. And so they've matched a lot of it with it. And it's a great location. And I appreciate your support and willingness to hear this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Representative Petersburg. Next on the agenda, House File 415, Representative Lizgar. Welcome, please proceed. Uh, Chair Lee and members, uh, thank you for hearing House File 415, a bonded request for Northland Learning Center in Virginia and Northern Lights Academy Special Education Cooperative in ESCO. Uh, we have combined the needs of these two cooperative school districts into one bonding request. I have two testifiers that can speak to each. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, whoever wants to go first, please identify yourself and proceed. I can go first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, my name is Dina Hagen, and I'm the Director of Special Education for the Northern Lights Academy, a special education cooperative school district in northeastern Minnesota. Northern Lights takes students with severe behavior, autism, and mental health needs from across 6,000 square miles surrounding Duluth. House File 415 is asking for bonding assistance of $6 million to purchase and renovate a building and use it for our Northern Lights school. We currently operate our school programs for about 50 K-12 students in three separate locations because it's the only option we have right now. In an old school basement, a church education wing, and part of a member district high school. Bonding would reduce the burden on our member districts and allow all of our students to learn and be safe under one roof. In fact, our co-op can't move forward with a facility project like this without help from the state. Co-ops can't go out for referendum vote like a typical district can. Our member districts only have their regular lease levy authority or their general fund for, for options. And several are maxed out and no one wants to add to the special education cross subsidy. We've been working for five years to find a solution and the Northern Lights teachers, paras, other staff are dedicated to the students they work with. They've been waiting patiently. Our students can't learn safely in typical schools, but they deserve to be able to be educated in a real school setting just like any other student. One quick story I'd like to tell you is that six years ago, we were able to bring a student to Northern Lights that was deemed too dangerous to go to school and was on home-based services. Now, thanks to our specialized programs, that student is going to graduate high school this spring. 
Members of the committee, we ask for your support of House File House file 415 so that our students with the highest needs can learn in quality spaces and not just in the leftovers Thank you so much for listening to my testimony today Welcome, please identify yourself and proceed Thank you Chair Lee and members of the committee. My name is Katie Heimdall and I'm the executive special education director for the Northland Learning Center located in Virginia Thank you representative Liz Lagarde for your carrying this bill we are a special education cooperative school district serving 10 school districts in northeastern Minnesota. As a cooperative, we service small school districts by providing intensive education to pre-K through age 21 students with severe disabilities. Northland Learning Center provides educational opportunities to students with severe behavior, autism, adult transition, and mental health needs from International Falls on the Canadian border down to Culver, which is located just north of Duluth, and from Hibbing over to Grand Marais, a huge geographic area larger than several U.S. states. In addition, we house an alternative learning center and office our itinerant staff in Virginia. Committee members, our 100-year-old school building is in such disrepair that currently students cannot even drink the water. House File 415 is a bonding request of $9 million in one-time funding to renovate our building. Our member school districts simply cannot afford to bear the entire cost of the project, which is north of $18 million. This investment in our facility would allow all of our students to have an environment conducive to meeting and servicing their severe needs equitably and provide a safe place to work. <coughs> Many of our students are transient through our region, some homeless, living in group homes, and some are bused an hour away from our indigenous population regions. All deserve an equitable and pleasant place to receive these services. To provide some context, we currently service two brothers who struggled with their school settings. They have been divided and with multiple foster families. Both are now attending our program daily. They rejoined as a family with their mother this summer and she has been in tears about the support and availability to see her children finally find success, which has lifted a huge emotional burden and provided healing for their family to move forward. Yes. Members, we ask for your support of House File 415 so that our most vulnerable students will have the equitable and quality education they deserve. Thank you for this opportunity to share my testimony with all, all of you today. Representative Erdahl. So thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, so the, the farthest distance traveled to Virginia for the school be about an hour. Is that correct, Ms. Heimdall? I didn't hear the last part of your question. OK, what's the, the, long, the farthest distance to the school? Ms. Heimdall. Yes, thank you. Um, about an hour, not much more than that. Otherwise, we service them in their districts. Representative Erdahl. Thank you, Ms. Chairman. How many students uh, would this building accommodate? Ms. Hondo. Thank you. We have 150 students currently at our location. Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chairman. Uh, are you at all related to any Heimdalls from Litchfield? <laughs> Ms. Heimdall. Thank you. I, could you repeat your question, please? <laughs> Representative Scrava. Am I mumbling today? Yes. yes. All right, I'll try to make it up. Uh, were you related to any Heimdalls from Litchfield? Oh, no. <laughs> Representative Scrava. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Um, this is for both uh, testifiers. What school populations do you serve? Like, which one do you serve and which one do you serve? Why don't we do it, Ms. Heimdall okay. first, and then Ms. Hager. Ms. Heimdall. Okay. The school population that I that I serve, as far as the total, yes, not just at our location. We we serve a total of 2,200 students, but we serve 150 at the location that we're renovating. Representative Scrava. Grand Marais, International Falls, Ely. Which schools? Oh, okay. Uh, International Falls, Ely, Cook County, uh, Rock Ridge, Hibbing. Uh, Net Lake. I'm missing one. Sure. I think I got them all. Okay. okay. Ms. Hagen, do you want to uh, respond? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we serve um, from north of Silver Bay, Minnesota, west over to McGregor, Minnesota, and then down to Willow River and everything in between except for Duluth. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to follow up on uh, Representative uh, Erdahl's. It's a two-hour drive from uh, Virginia to International Falls, and to Cook County is 
a light year away, three, three plus hours. So um, it is a long drive to move around to, to these different areas. So I just want to bring that up. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Representative Lizgar, or to your testifier, so House File 415 only have one appropriations in there. Was there supposed to be an amendment that included both? Mr. Chair, I believe that they were both in there. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Sounds good. That was uh, oversight of my end. Uh, so, you know, other questions. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have Representative Fryber, House File 365. Please proceed, Chair Freiberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's good to be back in front of the bonding committee. Um, Golden Valley's paid on-call staffing model is no longer viable. Not only is it difficult to recruit and retain paid on-call firefighters due to family and job obligations, the staffing model makes it difficult to respond to calls within industry standards. In response, the city is transitioning to the more modern duty crew staffing model like other suburban cities. Uh, this creates part-time jobs with predictable scheduled shifts and allows firefighters to use their training on a regular basis, so retention increases. Uh, current facilities are outdated, undersized for equipment and function and do not allow for moder modern firefighting operations and 24-7 duty crew staffing. This includes inadequate locker room space, including gender equitable amenities, insufficient physical capacity and site size, or building construction to accommodate day-to-day -day functionality, and lack of adequate training space, which means most training occurs on concrete and outdoors in all seasons. To ensure the long-term resiliency of the fire department and its operations, the plan is to consolidate two remote fire stations into one eastern station and maintain a headquarters station downtown in a new public safety building. This new station will have a significant regional benefit. Uh, Golden Valley Fire participates in the West Fire Academy, which is a partnership between Golden Valley and three to five other area fire departments to train new firefighters using each city's facilities for training. Uh, right now, Golden Valley Fire Department has to rely heavily on our partners due to our lack of facilities to accommodate hands-on training. A new station that incorporates training capabilities would be a resource for area fire departments to use. The Golden Valley Fire has mutual aid agreements to work out and train together with fire departments across the metro. Um, and the city also includes many regional amenities, including international employers such as General Mills, Allianz, and Tenant, three golf courses and regional parks, and major interstate highways. Um, that's just a brief um, outline, and I'd like to turn it over to my testifier. Welcome, please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. My name is Bethany Brunsell, and I am the Assistant Fire Chief for the Golden Valley Fire Department. Um, as you can see, Golden Valley is seeking $17 million to fund a new fire station. Um, as Representative Freiberg rep referenced, we are uh, going down from three stations down to two, unlike many fire departments that are expanding. This, we believe, will be right-sizing our fire department and enable us to move to that paid on, from the paid-on call to a duty crew staffing model. Currently, none of our three fire stations include bunk rooms to allow firefighters to sleep overnight. We're in the midst of the transition to duty crews, and currently we are only staffing our stations from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. because of the fact we don't have a place for anyone to sleep. So we need a new fire station in order to allow for staffing our stations overnight. Um, currently our stations are too small. As you can see from the handout you hopefully all received, the, door, the sides of the apparatus bay doors are just inches wider than our vehicles are currently. These stations were built over 40 years ago. Um, a lot has changed in the last 40 years in terms of firefighting equipment and vehicles. Gender is another one. 40 years ago, someone like me, as a woman in the fire service, would be incredibly rare. It's still not super common, but we need to be able to build for the future and allow for expansion of women in the fire service. Um, uh, also, as mentioned, we lack any of facilities to allow for hands-on training in our stations. They're very small, very cramped, and this means that we have to find ways of doing training either at other facilities outside of our city or by simulating a lot of things. Having a station that allows for hands-on training will allow us to have better trained firefighters to serve not only the Golden Valley residents, but also everyone who travels through, visits, and works in our community. Cancer prevention, prevention is another huge thing. Um, right now, you can see in the photos, our firefighters turnout gear is stored right next to diesel burning vehicles. We need to have spaces to separate that turnout gear away from the vehicles so that way we can help protect our firefighters from cancer. 
Um, the plots of land where our fire stations two and three exist currently are too small for us to expand and, and remodel those stations in a cost-effective way. And additionally, station two is located very close to the Minneapolis city border, and our station three is located, sorry, station two is located by St. Louis Park. Station three is located by Minneapolis. So we want to find a new location that will help better serve and provide effective response time to our entire city, as well as our mutual aid partners. Um, we really do feel like the receiving state monies is our only option for financing. Golden Valley does not receive any local government aid funding, and we send out about two to three million dollars per year in fiscal disparities. Golden Valley is also the sixth highest taxed city in Hennepin County, so we feel this is a very desperate need for our city to be able to fund this fire station, to continue to staff our stations, and to provide equity and training facilities that we need. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Chief, just to that remark, uh, in the bill you said, doesn't require a non-state contribution. Is there any amount that the city can contribute to the project if we were to consider it? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I've, at this time, there's no set plan for a city contribution. Most likely, the cost of finding a, a location for the station is going to far exceed what we have in this bill, so the city is going to have to um, contribute to the cost of it, um, but we don't have a set plan at this time. Seeing so, you other know, questions, uh, Chair Fiber, close the comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, this is an important project uh, for the city that will have a regional benefit. And as you put your bill together, I hope you will keep it in mind. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have two bills for represent. Actually, uh, one second. Let's take Chair Becker Finn since she has an emergency that she has to attend to. Uh, welcome, Chair Becker Finn. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee. Please proceed. Uh, so House File 569, if members have been on bonding before, uh, this is to create a uh, health and wellness center in the city of Cass Lake that would benefit uh, the members of the Leech Lake Nation, but also everybody who lives in the area. Um, there is a packet. It's better in color, um, so I'll email it to you guys so you can see it in color of uh, what we're trying to do here. I think it's important that people remember the area that we're talking about. If you'll, you'll see on the bill, uh, Representative Bliss is uh, the second author on the bill. This is actually the area he represents, but it is my home community. And uh, I just wanted to highlight where this is located and how important this is. This would be located on the shores of Cass Lake, uh, the actual lake in the city of Cass Lake, and uh, is really the heart of our community. And right now, uh, we don't have a space like this. We don't have a centralized area to work on language revitalization, to care for our elders, to care for our kids. We don't have anything like that currently in the Cass Lake area. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to my testifier from Leech Lake. Uh, Chair, before we uh, go to your testifier, can you briefly explain the A1 amendment? Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, yep. So the A1 amendment is adding um, a little bit more money uh, to a uh, allow us to have a couple of smaller satellite locations. Our reservation is very large, um, and with transportation challenges, we want to make sure that everyone in our community is uh, served by the project. Thank you. Welcome. Please identify yourself and proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Irene Fulstrom, and I represent the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. I'm the government relations manager, and I'm also a member of the Leech, ba Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe and was born and raised in Cass Lake, where this project will be located. Um, so I guess I'll just start out by, by pointing out that I know that a lot of the focus this session has been on equity, um, you know, restoring equity and, and, and moving forward and thinking towards the future. Um, this project would restore, gives an opportunity to the state to restore justice, I guess, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, we've been left behind in Cass Lake a lot uh, with as far as projects, definitely as far as bonding. Um, as far as facilities go, as far as opportunities for our youth, as far as opportunities and access to for our elders and our veterans um, to services and 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 uh, healthcare, um, you know we've been left behind. And so this project here, although it says a health and wellness center, which makes it sound sort of like a recreational center, it's it's not. This would be the heart of our community. This would be this would be building the heart of our community. Right now, we don't have that. We we are so. We have so many health inequities right now, and we always have been. I have always had those. Um, 
but right now we're looking to the state to assist us in, in helping us fund a central location where our community can gather um, to learn about wellness, to learn about health, um, to have access to uh, resources to learn about these things. Um, a couple of st statistics really quick. Um, so first of all, Leech Lake Reservation, the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe, we have the second highest childhood obes obesity rate in the entire country. The entire country, childhood, childhood obesity. We don't have facilities like this where we can, uh, our kids can go. We have gyms, we have high school gyms, we have a boys and girls club actually, a great boys and girls club, but they close and they have very restrictive hours and there's only so much that we can do there. So as a community, this would provide those opportunities where not only we can actually engage in those activities that, that teach our, our youth about how to live healthy lifestyles and how to change these, these current statistics that we have within the reservation to, to, to turn them to, to positive or to at least equalize in some way. Um, another statistic I wanted, statistics I wanted to point out is that um, so growing up, we didn't have anything at all in our community like this. We had our gyms, we had sports, but not everybody wants to play sports. Um, my high school graduating class, so most of the kids in my high school class uh, stayed back in Cass Lake. Um, a few of us went away to college. Three quarters of my high school graduating class is dead. They're, they're dead. And, and most of those reasons are because of reasons that have direct results of, of their, our health inequities and not having access to a lot of these opportunities that this health center would provide, this wellness center would provide. So it is, we've reached an alarming, we've, we're sounding the alarm and we're looking to the state and, and the state has asked us, what can we do? We need you to tell us what we can do to help um, alleviate a lot of these disparities um, in our communities. And we're telling you what it is and this is what it is. And um, so we're asking you for assistance with this um, willing to answer a lot. I could sit here all day and rattle <laughs> off statistics and, and, and make the case, but really what it boils down to is we've never asked for anything like this before, and we're asking for it now, and we're asking for your assistance. Thank you. Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and first of all, uh, I'm not against wellness centers. I've got a couple of them working out in my district, too. I think these are important to the community. Just wondering a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, is there any other funding, any type of match uh, involved with this? So we've already, um, we've already finished phase one. So we've already finished the design phase. We have the, um, the land is prepared. Um, we are shovel ready and ready to go. So we've already invested. A lot of our own, um, the, 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 the tribe has invested our own funds into that first phase. So we've invested about $2 million already. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, you know, $25 million is a sizable chunk as we go through these things. Uh, is there any contemplation for how to phase this or, or scale we've, it down mm -hmm. or something? We've looked at all that, uh, at all the options, and, and we, we, can't, we don't have an option for scaling it down per se because we're a large community. You know, it, it, this will, will serve a lot of people. Um, but once it is constructed, it'll be self-sustaining. We will be self-sustaining because we will have Medicare billing. Representative Erdahl. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, um, you can't scale it, all right. Uh, can you phase it? Do you have to have the whole 25 million in one? The way that we that we are looking at, we're currently- 28, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's 28 because we have the two satellites. No. Representative Erdahl. Thanks. Close the comments, Chair. I thank you, Chair Lee, and thank you, members, uh, for listening. I think the thing to remember is that this, this is one of the poorest areas of our state. It isn't like there are a lot of other options, like there might be um, in the area that I represent in Roseville or Shoreview. Um, and again, this Leech Lake has never come and asked for bonding dollars before, and this is this is a thing that our community needs and would appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank Next you. on the agenda to accommodate his testifier, uh, Representative Hussein, House File 1345. <coughs> Please uh, proceed, Representative Hussein. 1345. Thank you, Charlie and the members. I am. Uh, we're presenting bill uh, for 
Hall's file 1345 for St. Paul East College Bridge. This bridge has been 90 years old and uh, we know what happened in 35W, so we don't want that to happen again in our city. And a uh, million people, seven million visitors go through this bridge every year in the city of St. Paul. And I do have a testifier from the city of St. Director from Ramsey County. Director Ramsey County. Please identify yourself and proceed. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Sean Kershaw. I'm the public works director for the city of St. Paul. If you're downtown going to an event, the Excel Arena or the River Center, and you're traveling on eastbound Kellogg from 7th to Market, you're on a bridge. Most people don't realize that. Underneath the bridge is a viaduct that goes down to Exchange Street. And in the middle of all of those is the loading dock for the Excel and the River Center arenas. And that bridge is 85 years old, built in the mid-30s. It's beyond its useful life and desperately needs to be demolished and completely rebuilt. The proposal you have before you will help to rebuild the bridge and provide two new tunnels, um, one that's more pedestrian friendly to Exchange Street and replacing the viaduct, and a completely new loading dock for the Excel Arena and the River, um, River Center. Um, I'm happy to ask any questions that you have um, about the bridge or the project or its importance. Thank you, Director. Seeing no questions, closing comments, Representative Singh. This bridge is in the heart of the city, and uh, it is very important. So we want to make sure that we address this issue uh, that we are requesting for City of St. Paul and the state of Minnesota for that bridge. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Singh. Next on the agenda, we have two bills now for Representative Bajay. The first one is House File 191. <coughs> Welcome, Representative. Please proceed. Good to be back in Capital Investment Chair. <laughs> um, all right, here we go. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. Um, House File 191 supports the Northside Economic Opportunity Network's request for $6 million to construct, furnish, and equip a food business incubation facility. Neon works with entrepreneurs across North Minneapolis as they work to build wealth and create jobs in their community. One of the fastest growing industries is in the food prep and catering business. By having a food business incubator on the north side, low and moderate income entrepreneurs will have access to a commercial kitchen in addition to the program support provided by NEON to help their business thrive. So with that, I will turn to the specifics uh, to NEON CEO, Warren McLean. Welcome, please identify yourself and proceed. My name is Warren McLean. I'm president of the Northside Economic Opportunity Network, uh, also known as NEON. NEON was started in 2000. Well, first of all, thank you to you, Mr. Chair, and the members of the committee. Uh, NEON was started in 2006. Our mission is to build wealth for low to moderate income entrepreneurs in North Minneapolis and the surrounding communities. And in the last few years, NEON has provided 11,560 hours of technical assistance and provided $6.8 million in loans and grants to 2,256 clients. Uh, our, we have a Grow and Thrive campaign where we've raised about $5.3 million since November of 1920, 1920, I mean 2020. Uh, NEON exists to build wealth for black and BIPOC entrepreneurs in North Minneapolis. Our focus is on startups. Um, black entrepreneurs have 12 times the wealth of, uh, of their peers, and black entrepreneurs have a higher startup rate than their uh, white counterparts. They also, unfortunately, have a higher failure rate than their white startup uh, counterparts. Um, but that's where NEON comes in. We're there to change that trajectory so that our clients are more successful than the national average. Also, 54% of our businesses are women-owned, and 90% of our clients are from the north side. Um, our request today, again, is for $6 million, um, and it's to construct a commercial kitchen in North Minneapolis. The facility itself will be 22,000 uh, square feet. It will have 24 private kitchens, a 3,000-square-foot community uh, shared kitchen, 900 square feet of um, storage space for freezers, refrigeration, dry goods, receiving dock, uh, food pickup space, catering, and food delivery. Um, one of the things I want to point out is 40% of our clients are food entrepreneurs. And if you know anything about North Minneapolis, it's one of the largest food deserts in the country. 
Um, and so this is designed to address that particular need. Um, we conducted a study by the University of Minnesota Extension, and what they determined is in the first phase of our project, it will produce uh, $19.0 million, .0 million in uh, economic activity. It will create 261 jobs. Once, it's, once the facility is up and running, it will create, um, generate $26.2 million in, econ in economic activity and it'll create 265 jobs. Um, in addition to that, for every dollar invested in this particular facility, it will provide a $28.11 return. Um, the facility itself will service about 270 businesses and also generate a million dollars a year in revenue. And one thing I want to point out is that this is a proven model. Um, it's been used around the country. Uh, it's based on, and our particular facility is based on a, a, a facility that's in Chicago called the Hatchery. That's a 67,000 square foot facility. Um, and ours is about a third of that size. But that particular facility is in based in West Chicago, which has been very catalytic for that community. And if you know anything about West Chicago, it's much more challenging than, than North Minneapolis. So, um, so with that, um, that concludes my uh, uh, testimony. Thank you, President McLean. Seeing no uh, questions, close the comments. Representative Bowser. Uh, I'll do, well, no. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Next on the agenda, Representative Baje, House File 851. Please proceed. And then I understand, Representative Baje, you have the A1 amendment for reference? Yes, Mr. Chair. Please explain the A1 amendment the, quickly. The A1 amendment just changes the amount that we're seeking. Instead of $4 million, it's $6 million. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. House File 851 appropriates $6 million as amended to Phyllis Wheatley Center to rebuild Camp Parsons. The funding will go towards rehabilitating the camp by redeveloping the trails and renovating the buildings to revitalize a place where children get an opportunity to spend time in nature. The camp ran from the 1950s to the 1990s, and it's time to provide an experience for more kids to have fun in the beauty of Minnesota. The camp had been a staple in our community, allowing young people, including some of our very own colleagues in the legislature, a chance to experience a different environment and learn about the earth and other sciences. Uh, my testifiers from Camp Parsons will discuss more about the importance of revitalizing this camp and what it means to young people in our community. Thank you. Welcome. Please identify yourself and proceed. Hi, good afternoon. Um, this is Anthony Taylor. Thank you very much, um, representing Phyllis Wheatley Community Center. Please thank proceed. You. Yeah, thank you, Chair Lee. Uh, thank you, committee. Um, some call it camp, um, but we really call it really the best environment for youth, adults, and family development. Experiences really happening in nature-based experiences, offering adventure-based programs, experiences anchored in social-emotional learning. And so from all that, you can understand why we just call it camp. Social-emotional learning outcomes um, really is the process with which all young people, young adults, acquire and apply knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy, uh, identities, manage emotions, and achieve personal collective goals, feel and show empathy for others, and establish and maintain supportive relationships for responsible decision making. And we know that there's no stronger experience for that than outdoor experiences. In our world, additionally, uh, there's additional complexity related to outdoor experiences, specifically related to social justice, racial justice, and environmental justice. This is not new to Phyllis Wheatley. Phyllis Wheatley emerged uh, as part of a progressive movement in America to support communities living in challenge between the 1880s and 1920s. Hundreds of settlement houses were established in American cities in response to an influx of European immigrants and urban poverty brought on by industrialization and exploitative labor practices. Many settlement houses um, provided services uh, to the urban poor and European immigrants, including education, health care, child care, and employment services. Many settlement houses established in this era still exist today. Phyllis Wheatley is one of those. Phyllis Wheatley was focused on supporting the growing African-American community in Minneapolis in the 1920s, and we are here to celebrate our 100th anniversary of this coming year. Camp Captain Parsons is an entry point for youth and young adults to build skills and competencies in the outdoors that will launch them into the ecosystem of nature-based and outdoor experiences in Minnesota. This is not going to just take them from North Minneapolis, but it takes from the east side to Eveleth to Ely and beyond. 
Camp Catherine Parsons social emotional learning curriculum will offer age appropriate character development and, po for, and positive mental health and emotional wellness behavior intervention and healing and restorative practices based on five key areas. Self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. These five key skills will be taught and applied at all developmental stages at Camp Catherine Parsons for the children, the counselors in training, our young adult leaders, and our adult leaders. The majority of summer programming will be programming from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., bringing youth from the community served by Phyllis Wheatley's families, ages 8 to 13. Our day camp is designed to offer a progressive age stage appropriate outdoor experience where we will have approximately 72 young people on a daily basis um, experiencing uh, building relationships, outdoor skills building, canoe skills, um, first aid, wilderness first aid, open cooking, long trip preparation for many of the organizations that are anchor Minnesota institutions like Wilderness Inquiry, YMC Camp, Wijewagen, Minogen, Voyager Outward Bound, Big City Mountaineers. These are all organizations that have used outdoors as a way to build young people and build families. We also are in the beginning stages of an environmental education relationship with Watertown Schools District um, and the community education as well as Carver County Parks. So again, we believe that this is not just a camp serving a small group of youth, but it has regional and statewide significance. Lastly, we are developing stewards of the land and great citizens. The daily experiences are built around active teaching of living in relationship with the land and with each other in a way that supports sustainability and mutuality. Phyllis Wheaton's leadership is committed to acting sustainably and conscientiously as a good neighbor to the community and as a steward to the environment that we all share. It is actually special that a black-led organization owns 100 acres of land in one of the most pristine places in the country and has an opportunity to actually support a vision, a vision for our state of Minnesota, which we believe that children and families should be inspired to engage the natural world in ways to support physical activity, mental well-being, creativity, and appreciation for nature. The state of Minnesota believes that this is the case, and Camp Catherine Parsons is integral to a vision, and an investment in Camp Catherine Parsons is an investment in the state. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. So you know, questions, closing comments, Representative Bajay. Uh, did you okay, great, awesome. So uh, thank you, Chair, thank you, committee members. I think this is a really great opportunity to ensure that more kids are able to get out into nature, to see the beauty of Minnesota, and I thank you for your consideration. Thank, thank you. you. The next two bill on the agenda, we're going to jump around again. Representative Hussein, the first one is House File 578. Welcome back, Representative. Please proceed. I'll be quick. Thank you, Charlie, and the committee members. Uh, this bill is for capital investment uh, seeken for Innovation Center in St. Paul, which is located University Avenue. This is a great deal. Tony Santa Foundation is an organization that has a well-equipped and have been working in within St. Paul and the metro area and the greater Minnesota. But now they are trying to expand and try to build another building within my district, which we can provide a shelter, a place for the kids to stay, a place for them, an innovation them to learn. So I have Director Tony Sander right next to me, and I would love to see if he can testify. Mr. Chair, if you would allow me. Welcome. Please identify yourself to proceed. Oh, thank you, uh, Chair. Mr. Chair, uh, my name is Tony Sane with the Sane Foundation. Um, we've been a fast-growing um, organization um, in the Twin Cities, and it's a testimony to the, the good staff and the work that they were doing. We've always been a bipartisan or organization, and we think we've proven that we're good stewards and responsible with resources. Uh, when Chair, former Chair Erdahl was there, supported us through a bonding bill, which we build the Conway Community Center, which is now one of the flagship areas on the east side of St. Paul and serves, you know, over 100,000 visitors a year. And, you know, we triple the investment that the state gave to, to continue to support that area. Um, what we're trying to do is, I would like to also say that this is one of St. Paul, the city of St. Paul's uh, priorities. So um, in there, the city's uh, bonding priorities, this was one of them, as well as um, 
the ones you heard about. So we do have buy-in of support of the mayor. We do have um, support, and we were asked to write um, federal earmarks as well. Um, you know, we're looking for a, a, a hub for the work we do. You've helped us grow in the state, and we've expanded to St. Cloud and Moorhead, and, and um, we're looking at other areas, and this would offer our, us a statewide um, uh, training place. We're also building out our workforce development program. Um, as we support more and more young people, we're finding that we really need wraparound services. Currently, we started buying houses in the neighborhoods. We have five houses right now, and we, we, we host um, 13 members of the community that pay rent, have good history now, but feel safe, and we have a couple years to develop them. Um, the majority of this space would be used for housing. We would put over 100 units in there. If anybody knows St. Paul, um, we do have challenges with the rent amount for low-income families, and we also just have a challenge with the available housing that's available. The other space in there would, would be um, 20,000 square feet, which would be dedicated for other nonprofits to collaborate. We look at ourselves as an emerging leader in the market, but we've also been great partners with a lot of smaller and mid-sized organizations that looks for homes and makes it easier for us to partner. And lastly, through our workforce development, we would look to do some entrepreneurial um, retail space. We also look at it as, as you drive around the capital, not all the area is developed, and this would be an area, a way to revitalize this neighborhood um, by being an anchor tenant and bringing a lot more residents to the area. Um, so we want to thank you for your, for your consideration, Mr. Chair, and I'm open for any questions. Thank you. So just uh, on the housing piece, this will be for supportive housing and so non-market rate, is that correct? Yes, and we're actually tackling stuff a little different because the, the system hasn't always worked for everybody. But uh, so we, we buy houses now, and because we get donations for them, um, we don't have the same, we don't need to make the, the profit on them. We, we need to break even. So we're looking at it a little different. So, you know, over 50% of the, the, the units, we would offer sizable discounts to them, um, to people that work in these communities. And we say do good communities. So all of our employees, their jobs benefit the public. So open to other nonprofits, people that serve in AmeriCorps, educators and people that work in the healthcare system would have the opportunity to rent these reduced rates, um, these reduced units. Thank you. Closing comments, Representative Hussein. Uh, thank you, uh, appreciate it for having us here. And I spent some time, uh, the summertime in Conway, and I get to know a young kid who got mentorship there, worked for Tani Sana Foundation, and have a place for him to stay. So it's kind of like uh, empowering youth and the youth programs in throughout the city and the state of Minnesota. I uh, would love to see if we can support this cost. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Hussein. Next on the agenda, House File 2003. Representative Hussein. I promise, uh, Chair Lee, this will be my, my last one. And, <laughs> and for, for today, though. You never know if I can come back again. I have uh, African Development uh, Center, which is asking for a new building that located in my district. This organization has a good track record, building wealth and being for African immigrant communities and promoting internships, small business development, and the leaderships, education, economic, and within the district. So uh, I, I do have a testifier, Dr. Gilgal, Gilgalu, did I say right? Yeah, Gilgalis. Welcome, please identify yourself or proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee, and member of the committee. Uh, thank you, Representative. Can you speak into the microphone, please? Oh. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, Chair Lee, and member of the committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Hossein, for uh, carrying this bill. My name is Jean Galgalu, uh, founder, president, and CEO at Afghan Economic Development Solutions. AEDS is a nonprofit organization that serves African immigrants in Minnesota. AEDS provides business development training program. It's a 12 week 12 training program designed to support inspiring and uh, existing businesses to start or expand their businesses. We provide cultural specific technical assistance in different areas. We provide lending, financial capability, home ownership education, 
and housing counseling and creative place making, which is the intersection of art and culture for economic development strategy. In 2020, which is during pandemic, uh, the need for our service substantially increased. We served in 2020 uh, 1,400 clients. In 2021, we served 966 clients. In 2022, we served 895 clients. The business we supported are creating job and sustaining job in the community and in our region and paying tax. Many of these African immigrant businesses are those are renters. They don't own a uh, building, and they are are exposed to a threat to uh, um, gentrified displacement. So, because of that, we decided to purchase the building on Hamlin Midway. So, ADS decided to pres preserve African immigrant businesses in Hamlin Midway neighborhood by purchasing a 1926 built long vacant uh, building to convert to a cultural entrepreneurship center. The use of the building is for the grocery, uh, retail space, Africa, small African museum, and the ADS office to support uh, our businesses uh, from the, uh, the uh, Midway Center. I have with me uh, also uh, Lisa testifying. If you would allow, Mr. Chair. You got two minutes for your remarks. Please proceed. Identify got yourself it. and proceed. I am Lisa Kugler. I am a development consultant helping AEDS put together this project. And I just have four things to say. The building is worth rehabilitating. It's very visible. The brickwork is exceptional. And when the rehabilitation is complete, the building will last at least another 50 or 60 years. The grocery will be a food hub working to increase business opportunities and therefore jobs by increasing the market for immigrant farmers, manufacturers, and distributors. Many trade publications predict that African cuisine is becoming the next food fad, which makes sense. Lots of veggies, no gluten, exotic spices. So when fufu becomes as common as tacos, please remember you heard it here first. Um, Research has found that new businesses that receive wraparound services like AEDS survive longer than six years at twice the rate of businesses that don't get any help. And AEDS creates and retains over 1,000 jobs each year. So even assuming that half the businesses fail, which is far, far worse than the reality, in five years, the number of jobs created and retained total 13,853 because every year new jobs are created and retained from the services. Um, we have made 17 applications for private, federal, and local funds and have received an award from 14. We worked hard to get an EDA federal grant, but sadly we did not, and apparently no one in the Twin Cities got one. So you are the last piece of the puzzle and we are ready to go. Thank you. Close the comments, Representative Singh. Thank you for your consideration. And this African immigrant development center is well respected within our community and creating jobs for many, many community. And since it's been impact University Avenue and the metro area, not only they, do they give a grant to the community, but they also train them. They give them mentorships. They with them until they become this business very successful and they hold them accountability. And uh, it's, a great, it's a great organization and I look forward working with them and see if we can have your support. Mr. Thank you, Representative Hussein. Next on the agenda, we have two bills from Representative Fanky. First up is House File 752. Please proceed, Representative Fanky. Thank you, Chair and members. Starting my testimony before I sit down. Uh, this sub, uh, 752 is an appropriation to the organization Film North. I will let my uh, testifier take it. Welcome. Please identify yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you. My name is Andrew Peterson. I'm the executive director of Film North. 
Uh, Film North, the Minnesota 501c3 nonprofit, is seeking funding for its New Media Arts Center, an educational facility located in St. Paul's Creative Enterprise Zone. Film North is, an, uh, is a national leader in media arts, education, and artist support, and a driving force in Minnesota's creative economy. We serve media artists at all stages of their careers and throughout the state through education, professional development, and workforce training, helping to strengthen and diversify Minnesota's media arts industry. Our center is a shovel-ready, $12 million adaptive reuse project of an uh, historic Clarence Johnston building. Uh, our structure is an innovative private-public partnership that keeps the building on the tax rolls, and 70% of funding is in place through historic tax credits, new market tax credits, and over a million dollars in private donations. Um, it expands our current footprint by 33% and incorporates a state-of-the-art cinema, more classroom space, and green space and community space. Um, at the start of our pipeline, our youth programs, where 60% uh, of our students are, are people of color, over 80% qualify for free or reduced lunch, and they advance through our programs and trainings that lead them into careers in the film industry here. Um, uh, I want to thank everyone for their time today and I would welcome any questions. Thank you. Seeing no questions, close the comments on this one. Uh, thank you, Chair Lee. I, I'm very excited about this project. I hope I hope we can find a way to move forward with it. It's really cool. That's all. Thank you, Representative Fanky. Next on the agenda, Representative Fanky, House File 2013. Please proceed. 2013 is an appropriation for a new Humane Society complex. We have some uh, guest testifiers here. I will let them take it. Welcome. Please identify yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Lee and members of the committee for this opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Janelle Dixon. I'm the president and CEO at Animal Humane Society, and my friend here is Skittles. So I'm going to be talking on behalf of Skittles. <laughs> um, we're very excited to talk to you about House File 2013, which would provide $15 million in funding to support the construction of a new animal care campus for Animal Humane Society on Casota Avenue in St. Paul. With me today again is Skittles. This is a little hound puppy that recently came into Golden Valley. And she is just a representative of one of thousands of animals that we help on an annual basis. Puppies like Skittles are important to Minnesota. More than 65% of Minnesota families have pets as a part of their family. Would you like to have a little Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I asked if we could have her visit, but I don't know if we have permission. So, um, so most people think of pets as a part of family. Um, and later this week, some lucky family will be able to come in and adopt Skittles. Mine. So the bond between people and pets is at the heart of what we do. It is all about the human-animal bond. The Humane Society is one of the oldest nonprofits in, in Minnesota. We've been serving animals and people in the state since 1878, so more than 140 years. Each year, Animal Humane Society provides refuge, direct care, and essential services to help nearly 100,000 animals in our state. Animals in need, and in addition to adoption and surrender, many of the programs that we have are devoted to helping people keep and care for their pets. That includes outreach programs to the underserved communities in uh, the seven or 11 county metro area, low-cost veterinary services for pets of people in need, education and training programs, a pet food shelf, and temporary housing support for people with animals in transition. In addition, we partner with law enforcement agencies throughout the state of Minnesota to provide humane investigations and forensic expertise to fight animal cruelty in Minnesota. When animals are removed from an owner due to cruelty or neglect, Animal Humane Society guarantees care housing, and placement for those animals at no cost to the state, county, or local municipality. We receive no government funding to support our operations. Our work is funded through private donations, primarily 70% of our budget, and fee-for-service, 30% of our budget. We're here today to ask for the state to partner with us in the construction of a new 100,000-square-foot facility in St. Paul that will help us continue this work. We have never asked for or received funding of this kind in the past. This project's $45 million construction costs will be funded primarily through private donations. 
we have already secured $20 million from private funders with an additional uh, amount of funding in the pipeline. Given the project's extraordinary public benefit and ongoing economic impact, we're seeking $15 million in a one-time state funding to support construction of this facility, which is about one-third of that project. AHS has already purchased property for the facility and contracted with HGA Architects and Gardner Builders to complete the project, with groundbreaking expected to proceed soon after fundraising is completed. The new animal care campus will expand our ability to meet critical public needs throughout the state. There's a fact sheet in your committee packet that provides more details as well as a visual about the new facility, but I'd like to call your attention to a few highlights. It will include space to care for more than 150 animals at any given time with enhanced and new, newly thought of housing for animals that addresses their physical and psychological health, as well as a veterinary care center to help animals with even the most significant medical or behavioral challenges. It will include space to expand support for law enforcement related to animal neglect and cruelty, and it will include space for more programs devoted to helping families keep and care for their pets, including expanded education, training programs, and pet food pantry. Finally, it will include a public dog park and play yards, as well as indoor and outdoor spaces for educational and entertainment events. Once completed, the new facility will allow us to expand and diversify the services that we offer at our other existing facilities in Golden Valley, Coon Rapids, St. Paul, and Woodbury. The project doesn't just help animals and people who love them. This is an investment uh, in our community and in Minnesota's economy. Construction is expected to require more than 300,000 hours of labor, creating 250 jobs and two, 27 million in payroll. When completed, the new animal care campus will be Can I have you wrap up, please? Sure. More than 150 jobs and provide living wage and full benefits for an additional 300 new permanent professional positions. This is an important project, and we ask for your support. Thank you very much for hearing us today. Close the comments. Representative Finke. Um, this is a great project. Puppies are great. Everybody should fund them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, House File 807, Representative Coulter. I think it, this is an open concept. That's really I would assume so, yeah. Welcome, Representative. Please proceed. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I literally don't know how to follow that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, I know I obviously don't need to tell this committee how deeply grateful we are all, we all are, excuse me, uh, for those who have served our nation in the armed forces. and particularly for those who have died in the line of duty. What may surprise you, though, is that in Bloomington, the fourth largest city in our state, there is no memorial to these individuals. As a lifelong resident of Bloomington, to be frank, that's personally disappointing to me. House File 807 would assist with changing that by providing $350,000 in bonding dollars to the city of Bloomington for a memorial that would be located on the grounds at Bloomington Civic Plaza, where our farmers markets and Pride Festival and concerts and other gatherings take place, ensuring that it would be a prominent feature in our community and would be visited by folks who come from all over to those events. Uh, Bloomington Remembers Veterans, whom you'll hear from soon, has done, a tr done tremendous work to raise the funds to construct it, and I think it is fitting and proper that the state of Minnesota help as well. And with that, I'll turn things over to my testifying. Welcome. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Colder. My name is Michael Dardis. I'm the president of the Bloomington Remembers Veterans Group that's been working on this memorial for the design, fundraising, and eventually to build it on the grounds of the Bloomington Civic Center. I'm a combat veteran of the Vietnam War. Our group is composed of volunteers who are mostly veterans of, Viet of the Vietnam era. We are a nonprofit 501c3, uh, excuse me, 501c3 group that's been established in 2018, so we've been raising funds for about three years, more give or take, more or less. Uh, we conducted a, natural, a national search and selected Leo Daly in 2020, a local firm to design and build a memorial on the grounds of the Bloomington Government Center. This company is a, has a nationally, national and international reputation for innovative designs. They designed the World, World II Memorial, excuse me, they designed the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C., as well as other memorials such as the Firefighters Memorial 
on the grounds in St. Paul. Their innovative design is a beautiful piece of landscape architecture that recognizes veterans in many unique ways. The total estimated cost is $750,000. Uh, the request we're making of 350 is about 40% of that. The rest of it will be made up through private donations, which we have so far raised about $150,000 in about a year and a half. We are pleased that not only will the memorial honor veterans' sacrifices, but also just their service, because their service alone can be hazardous, dangerous, and disruptive to families and their whole lives. We'll also honor the support they receive from loved ones in doing these difficult tasks. It would provide immediate support and recognition to approximately 4,000 veterans that reside in Bloomington who at present have, as Representative Kohler said, no, no, uh, no way to honor their service in the city. The memorial will be the first one in the state of Minnesota to allow a veteran to record a firsthand story concerning their service. This would be on a living dog tag, and I'll show you an example of that if I can get it up here. Of course, there it is. This is a, a type of metal uh, dog tag, we would call it from the service, that would be hung from metal poles in the memorial. It would have a QR code on it. That QR code allows the veteran to record a personal message that will survive way beyond the veteran's life. These tags are designed to last for many, many decades, actually, with the stainless steel. Now, uh, on this dog tag, we would also obviously have the veteran's name, the service information, branch of service and recognition, uh, with certain awards like the Purple Heart. I personally have a Purple Heart, so would have that on mine in that, in that situation. Now, having the memorial on the grounds of the Bloomington Civic Center, Civic Center, Government Center, is a perfect location to share these stories with any Minnesotan or out-of-state visitor. Actually, we believe it'd probably be an attraction into itself with the Mullo Americans in the, in the city. There's a lot of things, and this would also provide some art in the western part of the city, which would be desired. Finally, this memorial will allow us to enhance the value and, and, act, and help gain access to mental health services needed not only by veterans, but the general public. We've been working with health partners to develop a concept to use QR codes to enable people to retrieve critical mental health information in an area on the memorial that's specifically designed for a contemplation and quiet time uh, we want to basically have the message that they are not alone. Um, with this in mind, I completed my, my pitch, so uh, I'm open to any questions you have. Thank you. See no questions. Uh, close the comments, Representative Coulter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I do um, just want to draw members' attention. I believe you have a handout, <clears throat> excuse me, um, detailing um, this memorial, and I think it really is an exciting and, and innovative way of, of honoring our veterans um, and, and all those who have served our nation. Um, I would just close by saying that this request is in keeping with uh, past bonding projects for similar memorials um, and with the public and regional purpose that bonding dollars are intended for. Um, funding this project, I think, would be a, a strong statement for our state and our veterans in a truly unique way. So thank you all so much for your time. Thank you. Next on the agenda, Chair Hurt, House File 812. Welcome, Chair. Please proceed. Good morning, Chair Lee and Committee. Please proceed. I will be quick, Chair Lee. This is a bonding request for um, Playwright Center. The playwright has been in front of this committee before. It is House File 812. And I have a lot of remarks prepared, but I'm not going to say any of them so that I could get you back on schedule. I'm going to let my testifiers be the one to speak to this. I do just want to point out that this organization has um, received other outside funding because this, this project was so important 
that uh, they have secured state funding, but they also secured federal funding and a lot of private uh, funding in order for them to complete this project, and this should be the last phase of the project request for us. So with that, Chair Lee, I'm going to turn it over to my testifiers to provide comments today. Welcome. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chairman Lee and members of the committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Peron Yousafzada, and I'm the new Interim Associate Artistic Director at, the Play at Playwright Center. Prior to accepting this appointment and moving to the Twin Cities, I had worked with the center as a freelance theater director, largely over Zoom during the pandemic. Even remotely, the culture of the, of the center, one of humanity, abundance, and possibility, was palpable and refreshing. I took this job and moved here because I fundamentally believe in the power of new, of new work in theater. Whereas many organizations pay lip service to the ideas of equity and inclusion, at Playwright Center, it is fundamental to its mission and ethos. As a woman of color and the child of Iranian immigrants, I can't tell you how long I searched for this sense of belonging in the American theater. Finally, I am at home. That sense of artistic home has only grown scarcer as our industry reels from the effects of the pandemic. Other new play development organizations across the country have closed. Producing theaters are relying on the familiarity of tried and true classics in order to sell enough tickets to make ends meet. There is, in the field at large, a feeling of fear and scarcity. None of this is conducive to an artist with a bold new idea for a new play. This makes the work we do at Playwright Center all the more essential. Artists need a space of humanity, abundance, and possibility. We need artists to dream the worlds of new plays so we can be galvanized to co-create a better one, not for, only for ourselves, but for our children. We need the act of gathering to share stories, practice empathy, and reconnect with a shared sense of love and community. Already in my short time here in person, I see how confined this critical work has become by the current building. To be all that it is and all that it can be for artists, audiences, and our society, my home, Playwright Center, needs a new home. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Seeing no questions, close the comments, Chair Her. This is a great project. It's really wonderful for our community and uh, support it. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have two bills for Representative Tapke. First up, House File 847. Welcome, Representative Tacky. Please proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. Um, House File 847 is uh, Merriam Junction Riverbank Stabilization. So this is a uh, really uh, exciting project. Uh, it is south of Shakopee, between Shakopee and Jordan. It connects uh, a massive uh, major regional trail connections, and so it has a bridge, uh, trail bridge that will go across the Minnesota River between um, Carver and Louisville Swamp, and so Louisville Swamp is a really incredible nat natural area right along the Minnesota River um, that I encourage everyone to get to and check out at some point. Um, but we are asking for today in the uh, geo bonds and uh, 11 and a half million for this project. We have Deanne here to uh, talk to you about how it will be benefiting our communities. Hi. Welcome, please identify yourself and proceed. Um, Chair Lee, representatives, my name is Deanne Crote. I am here with my husband, Peter, who is my bike partner, uh, to support the Miriam Junction Trail and the Riverbank Stabilization Project. We live in rural Scout County and purchased a side-by-side -side tandem e-bike early COVID. When we first got the bikes, we traveled rural roads, but quickly realized that trails would be safer and a whole lot more scenic. Uh, Peter and I became quick fans of rail trails and average about 1,200 miles annually. We ride throughout south central Minnesota, but our favorite and closest trails are the Minnesota, River, um, Minnesota Valley River Bluffs and the LRT. We start either in Victoria or Chaska and we end up in Hopkins. We ride during the week because the trails are busy on the weekends. It's encouraging to see other seniors on the trail, but also a thrill to see young families, all in helmets and learning proper trail etiquette. The Miriam Junction Trail has been in the works for a long time, and it's exciting to be close to making this regional trail connection a reality. In this part of the Minnesota River Valley, there are thousands of acres of beautiful natural areas, but they have limited access. The Miriam Junction Trail would be a paved and flat trail providing 
the needed accessibility. This trail will connect Carver and Scott counties to the regional trail network and will stabilize the riverbank to stop erosion, which presently is sending a barge worth of sediment downstream every year. Projected use of the trail is 129,000 people annually, and the use of this trail will be far reaching well beyond Scott County and Carver County. It's a beautiful setting with a connection to historic downtowns as well as the Renaissance Festival. Thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts with you today, and I ask that you please support the state bond request. Thank you. Uh, Representative Taki or Director Fries, are you able to uh, provide a breakdown of the different components of the requests? I understand there's four different components. And if you don't have it today, it's fine. If you could follow up with that information, that'd be great. Are you asking for the cost of the components, Shirley? Yes, for each one so that we just have that for our record. Okay, I'd be happy to provide that. It's, uh, I, can, I can provide it now, but I can also send it to you. Uh, yeah, you can provide it now and also identify yourself, please. Okay. Thank you. My name is uh, Shirley, members of the committee. My name is Lisa Fries, and I'm the Transportation Services Director um, at Scott County. Um, with the uh, stabilization of the riverbank, um, the total construction cost for both the trail and the stabilization is um, 23 million. Um, the uh, riverbank stabilization piece of it is $8 million. Um, there are um, several bridges that need to be reconstructed, some of which are necessary to assist with the stabilization. And those bridges um, total uh, $6 million. Uh, the main span bridge over the river uh, is $4 million. And then the remainder of the trail, uh, which we already have funding for, uh, is about $5 million. And uh, we, the county, have already spent $2.5 million in design and um, a million in right-of-way costs. And we expect to spend a, another um, it's a very difficult construction job, so we expect to spend another million in um, construction engineering. Thank you, Director. Closing comments for this bill, Representative Tapke. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. So this is uh, a really great bipartisan bill. So this, uh, in addition to my uh, district, this also is uh, directly impacts uh, Representative Bakeberg's district, Representative Harder's, Harder's district, and uh, throughout and the the trail system throughout there. So that's uh, a lot of benefit for this project, and I appreciate your support. Thank you, Representative Tapke. Next on the agenda, House File 1191, Representative Tapke. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. The second project that we're gonna talk about today is a project in downtown Shakopee. And so this is on the south side of uh, the Minnesota River in our area in Scott County. We're one of the only places that does not have any uh, higher education. So we don't have any uh, locations for higher education in the county and in our general uh, region south of the river. And so this is a project in, uh, in downtown Shakopee that will allocate $4 million cash for um, improving a piece of land and creating an innovation hub as higher education. I have uh, Mr. Kursky here to explain the project. Welcome, Director. Please identify yourself and proceed. I'm Michael Kursky. I'm the Director of Planning and Development for the City of Shakopee. Chair Lee and members, thank you for hearing this bill uh, for funding towards the $14.5 million LEED certified uh, facility designed by Gensler. It would be one of two similar facilities in the United States. There are none in the Midwest. They're all on the East Coast. Minnesota was a leader in innovation for almost 100 years. Think about the great companies that started here. Target, Cray Computing, Medtronic, Best Buy, General Mills, Pillsbury, Green Giant, C.H. Robinson, just to name a few. Today, unfortunately, we are 46th in the nation on manufacturing skills, production, and hard tech companies. Our goal is to find individuals in the state that can be the next one of these great companies to make things right here in Minnesota. Why do we need a center for innovation? These are places where the next Apple, Hewitt Packard, and Medtronic will come out of. Today, startup companies, no matter what industry, need support. The Innovation Hub is for companies that want to develop a product or service that can be exported outside of Minnesota. What type of companies today would you find in the Hub? We are already working with 15 small companies who would be using services in the Hub, which include mentoring, financial support, and an honest evaluation of their market potential. 
companies not only come from Shakopee and Scott County, but today we also have companies that we're working with from Burnsville, Egan, Waconia, and Victoria. What about future employees needed by these companies? We'll be offering state-of-the-art advanced manufacturing training. We will engage with our BIPOC community, including the Shakopee, Minnetowakan Sioux community, to find not only great ideas, but great employees. Minnesota State University, Mankato, will have a large presence here, along with their community college partners. We'll be engaging with the local school district and other colleges to provide internship opportunities with our startup companies. The hub is essential for Minnesota to continue to thrive, to build talent, and build small businesses. It is a partnership between the state and the federal government. We have received support from Senator Klobuchar, Senator Smith, and Representative Craig um, in directed congressional funding for the private sector and also our service providers. It creates a one-stop shop to grow Minnesota's next great companies. Thank you, Director. I see no questions. Close the comments. Representative Tapke. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and members, again, for uh, this second bill. This, as you heard from Mr. Kursky, is a bill that has a lot of different stakeholders in the bill from Senator Klobuchar, Representative Craig, the Shakopee, Midwalk, and Sioux community, uh, private business throughout uh, the state. And this $4 million will help us get this project off the ground. And I appreciate your support. Thank you, Representative Tapke. Thank you, sir. So before we move on, I just want to acknowledge that uh, we have Representative Kozlowski's two bill, our two remote test fire will be moved towards the end to accommodate the representative's schedule. And so we're going to jump to Chair Acom, House File 1536. Welcome, Chair. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members, and happy St. Patty's Day to everybody. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to be with you to present House File 1536, a bill to complete the regional lake effect project, also called the Panaway, which is located in the city of Wyzetta. This regional project serves visitors from across Minnesota and beyond, and I want to thank the Capital Investment Committee members who previously toured this special place on the bonding tour um, with former Chair Murphy. Um, and so, Mr. Chair, under your leadership and your pre predecessor, the state has been a partner in previous stages of this project, and I want to thank you for that. And if you'd allow, I'd like to um, turn it over to my testifier who can tell us um, a little bit about the project. Welcome. Please identify yourself and proceed. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Happy St. Patrick's Day. My name is Joanna Mouton, Mayor of Wyzetta. Thank you, Chair and Representative Acom, for the opportunity to speak. Panaway is the community's vision to restore, protect, and enhance public access to the, one of the most treasured assets to our community and broader region, Lake Minnetonka. Panaway grew out of the work of the Lake Effect Initiative, which solicited input from thousands of people for nearly a decade, with the goal of creating a lasting and meaningful public connection to Lake Minnetonka for the entire region to enjoy. A relatively small community of 4,400 residents has been envisioning safe year-round access to the lakefront for many decades. The city is requesting $8.28 million in state bonding funds. The entire project cost is $31.5 million. The city has funded and completed phase one of Panway at a total cost of $10 million to reconstruct Lake Street and replace a lakeside parking lot with a beautiful public plaza, which has been incredibly successful. The city received $4 million of its $10 million request in 2020, which is being utilized for phase two. We are hopeful that construction will commence on phase two this year, which includes approximately 1,500 linear feet of boardwalk spanning along the lakeshore in downtown Wyzetta. New community docks open to the public, and we are requesting the remaining funds for our, from our original request to complete phases two and three. Due to inflationary pressure on the cost of labor and materials, our request has increased from $6 million to $8.28 million. The final phase, phase three, includes accessibility improvements in new public restrooms at the park surrounding the historic train depot, which is on the National Historic Registry, and charter boat docks, both of which attract visitors from throughout the region. It also includes restoration of the old railroad foreman's house, which is also on the National Historic Registry, tucked between the railroad and the lake. The restoration will transform the house into a learning center. This house will be surrounded by a new eco park showcasing lake habitat, restoration techniques, and STEM learning initiatives. 
In closing, Chair and members, this funding would create access to Lake Minnetonka for all Minnesotans to enjoy. You won't have to live on the lake to enjoy the lake. I believe you have one page summary of our request and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Chair, Representative Acomb, and committee members for your time today. Thank you, Mayor. So the handout uh, for the final phase is at 6.3, but the request is 8.28. Is that because of inflation? That so is correct. Two million dollars for inflation? Yes, Chair. Okay. So you know other questions? Let's close the comments, Chair Eco. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have Representative Cha, House File 1624. Welcome, Representative Cha. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair and uh, members of this committee. <coughs> I'm here to present to you HF 1624, a uh, bill asking for 15 mil for the capital investment in Woodbury. And uh, because of the essence of time, I will turn over my time to my testimony. Welcome, Testify. Mayor. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee and members of the committee for allowing the city of Woodbury to come before you today. My name is Ann Burt. I am the mayor of the city of Woodbury. Thank you, Representative Cha, for your support and leadership in assisting the city of Woodbury with this bonding request. Thank you also to the committee for learning more about this project in your fall 2021 bonding tour. And a big thank you also to Governor Walls for including this project in his bonding recommendation. We come before you today to request $15 million in bonding for a regional asset for the East Metro and the state of Minnesota, a place called Central Park. Central Park is a regional community facility and a hub of public spaces and services for the entire East Metro. Visitors from every corner of Minnesota come for gatherings, business meetings, programs, and special events. Health, recreation, and education services attract teens, seniors, immigrants, and families from all over the region. The facility hosts an early learning and English language learner educational zone, an indoor playground, the sixth busiest library in the state, and many recreational programming and event opportunities. A senior living facility and the YMCA are attached by a skyway and a large indoor garden and amphitheater bring it all together, giving its name Central Park. With the help of some state bonding, we hope to embrace the full potential of this facility as, it, as a regional asset by expanding communal gathering spaces, adding 18,000 square feet of multi-purpose space capacity, enhancing the environmental efficiency, and improving classroom and learning environments for early childhood and adult education and English language students, we can ensure that this remains a natural congregation spot for an attractive hub for many public services. In conclusion, its unique combination of an indoor park, play, learning, and resources make this facility a vibrant regional destination. By investing in improvements to this facility, we can ensure a special sense of belonging and pride extends to all visitors that needs are being met at this popular and well-used facility. Again, we're seeking $15 million from the state in support of this vision, and thank you for your time and consideration of this request. Thank you, Mayor. Seeing so, you no know, uh, questions, close the comments, Representative Chai. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Lee and um, the members of this committee for considering uh, this bonding bill, uh, Woodbury is uh, vital to East Metro of Minnesota, and I hope uh, you guys will consider to include this into your bonding bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, House File 1719, Representative Perez Vega. Welcome, Representative. Please proceed. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm the lead author for House File 1719, a cash appropriation for Metropolitan Center for Independent Living, also known as MCIL, to renovate and expend their facility, which they own. MCIL is a Minnesota statutory nonprofit organization. Subdivision 8, Center for Independent Living, this cash appropriation request is about investing in the state of Minnesota statutory nonprofit so that they have the right size facility to do the work that they are mandated to deliver by state law. Metropolitan Center for Independent Living was established in Minnesota in 1981 and has the mission of removing barriers, promoting choices, and assisting people with disabilities in achieving independent living. The agency serves over 5,000 people annually 
is an operation site for Disability Hub Minnesota and assisting with over 22,000 callers per year. Recently, Jesse Bethke Gomez, the executive director of MCIL, who's also here as part of our presentation, attended a March 1st meeting at the White House as a recommended by Jill Jacobs, Commissioner Administration on Disabilities Administration for Community Living, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. MCIL is working on several projects to assist in solving the direct care worker shortage shortage crisis in Minnesota. And uh, here to present Chairman Lee is Jesse Bethke. Welcome. Please identify yourself and proceed. Chairman Lee, members of the committee, I'm Jesse Bethke Gomez, the Executive Director of Metropolitan Center for Independent Living. Representative Pera Vegas, thank you so much for your introduction. Uh, we have been working a very long time on this facility. Thanks to funding by the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation, uh, we were able to conduct a feasibility study to look at the potential of a capital campaign we were also able to hire CRISO, who developed a strategic facilities plan. What you see before you is a plan that looks in requesting $7.5 million and then raising the rest from other government sources, the federal government, as well as from the capital campaign. This facility is very critically important for us to be able to provide the services that we do. Helping people with disabilities go from a facility into the community is a huge part of our work. This past year, I'm pleased to share with you that we helped over 636 people go from a facility into a secure community housing. What does that mean in terms of the savings to the state of Minnesota? That saving ranges from anywhere from 32.6 million, upwards of 91.6 million. Helping people with disabilities fully realize their life of independent living and to live in the community is at the heart of our organization. We know from all of the people with disabilities in the state of Minnesota, about 50% live in the seven county metro area. So for us, it's an important uh, investment in our ability to help people live their full life and independent life. And uh, we're grateful to you for your consideration of this request. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back to, to you, sir. Thank you. So you know, questions, closing comments. Thank you, Chairman Lee. Uh, you know, we've got to support uh, those in need, and our disabled community definitely needs a lot, uh, especially with the growing increase of what's needed in our senior homes for disabled. Uh, I know of this program. I grew up right in, right in my district recognizing how much this has served all of our community members. So I do ask that members of the committee support this, and I look forward to answering any questions in the near future. Gracias. Thank you, Representative Perez Vega. Next on the agenda, Representative Hollins, House File 1720. Welcome, Representative Hollins. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee. Thank you, committee members. Um, House File 1720 provides $5 million for the Plaza del Sol building located at 990 Payne Avenue. This building is a fixture on the east side, and the Latino Economic Development Center has taken on renovating this building to house small business incubators restaurants, a commercial kitchen, office space, educational classroom space, and much needed event space on the east side of St. Paul, where I live and represent. Um, this project is shovel ready, and the Latino Economic Development Center has done extensive fundraising to acquire the matching funds. The state funding is the last piece of the puzzle. In your packet, there's a one-pager with information about the organization as well as the renderings of the project. It's a space and idea that's really incredibly exciting to see coming to life, especially on Payne Avenue, which is an area that has not been heavily invested in but is really up and coming. Um, my testifier, Mr. Henry Jimenez, will speak a little bit further about the project and some of the outcomes. Welcome, Director. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Henry Jimenez. I'm the Executive Director of the Latino Economic Development Center. Uh, Plaza del Sol is nearly a $10 million project with uh, $5 million of that already secured. We have invested a significant amount of time and money uh, for this uh, project on the east side to be shovel ready. Uh, construction could start as early as this summer if our request was granted this session. LEDC acquired the 25,000 square foot building in 2020 to save several businesses from displacement. Because of LEDC, these businesses will continue to serve the community by providing culturally and linguistic appropriate services and goods. The building will also serve as the future home of LEDC to continue to serve the increased demand of entrepreneurs and small business owners gain access to capital to start or expand their businesses 
along with thousands of technical assistant hours that are much needed. In the last two, year and a, two and a half years, we assisted nearly 500 businesses and 5,000 households access over $22 million in federal, state, and local funding. Because of our success, I anticipate the number of clients we serve per year to continue to grow. This is why the redevelopment of Plaza del Sol is so much needed in our community. Plaza del Sol will be home to several business on, businesses on the first floor. It will have a commercial kitchen on the back part of the building that will be used 24-7 by 30 to 40 small business tenants, with most coming from members of the local community. The community will also have access to classroom and event center space on the second floor. There is a lack of access for this type of space that could host large family gatherings, weddings, quinceañeras on the east side, and uh, much more other uh, events. The community is excited about all of this, that we already get calls asking us for booking information. This is the type of community development project we are all interested in, because one building will help the small business sector, aspiring entrepreneurs, nonprofits, community, and culture. The east side needs investments from our state and it is the first project we bring forth to this committee ever and have been doing so since 2020. Since then, we have obtained the support from multiple local governments and numerous private and philanthropic donors. We have done everything everyone has asked us to do and hope that this committee will support our request this year. Help us continue to help our small business sector uh, and our general east side community. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I urge you to support the ESI and fully support this BIPOC-led project. Thank you. Closing comments, Representative Hollins. Thank you so much for your time, committee, and for Representative Lilly, who I know didn't believe that I was really an East Sider. I really am an East Sider, and I hope that you all can support this going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hollins. Next to the agenda, we have two bills for Representative Clarity. First up, House File 1740. And Representative Clardy, I understand that you have a DE-1 amendment for reference. Please explain the DE and proceed. Yeah, thanks, Chair Lee. Um, I'd like to have the DE-1 amendment adopted. And what it is, is um, this bill mirrors the language of my House File 2401, which is in Veterans Affairs Committee. Um, and... I'm also the author of that one. So it increases the appropriation matches um, to the recent cost estimates by the county, and it makes some changes to the language based on what MMB um, offered. Um, so would you like me to continue? Yep, just okay. please proceed. Great. Um, this is a five mile long greenway, and it's going to be the longest greenway, um, the longest greenway that um, honors the Minnesota veterans and it, it, it's planned in part of like a 200 mile project um, which is a regional trail system in Dakota County. This section of the trail will connect Lebanon Hills, um, I'm sorry, this, so this section will connect Lebanon Hills um, to the Mississippi um, River Greenway and go through Egan to Invergrove Heights. Um, and so this request is, um, will address the at grade crossings with the highway. And Chair Lee, I'd like to uh, introduce Dakota County Commissioner Joe Atkins um, to discuss the project. Commissioner, welcome back to the House. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here. I just wanted to note we did adopt that puppy. Uh, and uh, we, we put it in the committee administrator's car for her birthday. So um, <clears throat> thank you for taking the time and thank you for your, your patience uh, this afternoon. You've got an awful lot of really good projects, but this one's the very best. Um, and that's because it actually, it combines both honoring uh, Dakota County's veterans. We have 24,000 veterans in Dakota County. There is no memorial. It's the second largest number of veterans in any county in Minnesota, second only to Hennepin County. And at the same time, it is absolutely crucial to pedestrian safety. This is Dakota County's top priority for pedestrian safety. It crosses two busy highways, you know, Highway 52, Highway 3, and an active rail line. Literally hundreds of thousands of users who are going from our busiest park to our busiest uh, greenway 
this is how they get from one stretch to another. And uh, so we, we combine the two uh, great ideas uh, as Representative Clardy, who thank you very much for carrying this bill for us, um, <laughs> noted it will be the longest veterans greenway in the country. Uh, it is also the most inclusive veterans memorial um, anywhere here in Minnesota. Um, the, the very first node um, honors our Native American veterans, for example. And I could go on and on, Mr. Chairman, but I know you guys have a very long calendar. Um, we would very much appreciate uh, your support. It is a scalable, I heard some of your questions earlier. Uh, it's a scalable project. Uh, it just means that it would take a little bit longer to get done if we don't get the full request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members. Thank you, Commissioner. Close the comments on this bill, Representative Clarkey. Um, I just want you to keep in mind that the veterans um, always write that blank check, you know, when they decide to serve. And I think this is a project that people would love to get behind. Thank you, Representative Clary. Next on the agenda, House File 2402. Representative Clary, proceed. Thank you. So 2402 will uh, fund a new mental health um, crisis recovery center in West St. Paul. Um, I do carry, or I do cover five different cities, so this is a totally different area of town. Um, the guild, um, we, we currently call it guild, and so basically it operates right now in three older houses, and they're not um, suitable for long term, um, and they lack accessibility. So this new project would um, be like a 15,000 square foot um, facility that includes 16 um, bed, um, 16 bedrooms and then also private bathrooms for safety and security. It would also allow places where um, assessments and support could be uh, conducted. And so this uh, facility would be built on county-owned county -owned land, which is already identified um, adjacent to the Dakota County Northern Service Center. And with that, Mr. Chair, we have represent not representative, <laughs> former representative, but... Um, County Commissioner. Commissioner, please identify yourself again and proceed. Again, Joe Atkins, Dakota County Commissioner, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, um, Representative Clardy summed it up very well. This is our top priority project when it comes to buildings. Uh, this is the place where folks go when they're at that very lowest moment in their lives. Uh, and the goal here is to keep them as close to their support system, as close to their family members as they can possibly be, which aids in their healing. Um, it's a intensive residential treatment facility. We've already got planning commission and city council approval. Dakota County has already committed the land. Um, this is in a very um, costly area of uh, the Twin Cities. Uh, we've committed to what would be in the neighborhood of a half a million dollars a year in services. We've got a partner in Guild, uh, who I'm guessing you're familiar with. We've had success last year uh, with the uh, with the legislature supported uh, through DHS's funding. The state wants to get this done, and we want to help. The challenge is the, uh, the funding that's necessary. Prices have gone up dramatically. What was anticipated by DHS to be about a five or six million dollar project turns out to be about 13 million. And uh, we'd appreciate your help as we seek to help those who are in the toughest spot in their lives. Thank you. So Commissioner, in the handout uh, for the project comp says that you got 3.5 from the state, from Bonnie. Was that from the Regional Behavioral, Behavioral Health Grant? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I will look through the pillar to my friend Emily. Um, yes, yes, it was. I'm certain of that, Mr. Chairman. Okay, and so you're asking for ten, so you're asking for the state to do the entire project, then, Commissioner. That would be very helpful, Mr. Chairman. Um, we are we are willing to do a portion ourselves, um, but as it turned out, it was considerably more costly than anyone, including the state, anticipated at the time. Let's follow to see how much the county could put into the project, too. <laughs> you know, you would have been a hell of a trial lawyer, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Um, I would need to visit with my, my colleagues. Since this was um, prompted by a, um, a push by the state to create these sorts of facilities, we thought it was appropriate to ask for the full amount. Um, that, that being said, as we fully believe in the, uh, in the need for this, I just don't know what our commitment as a county would be, but I can certainly check with my colleagues. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Close the comments, Representative Clarke. Dignity and accessibility. It's the time is now. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have two bills for Representative Reen. The first one is House File 900. Welcome, Representative. Please proceed. Please proceed. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm here to present House File 900. Um, it's a bill to fund our county um, road highway 18. That's a seesaw. Um, and I have the, our county engineer here to testify as well. Please identify yourself and proceed. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Lyndon Robgent. I'm the director of public works for Carver County. I'm here to support House File 900, which requests 10 million in state general obligation bonds for 82nd Street or future County Road 18 in the cities of Victoria, Chaska, and Chanhassen. Uh, I'm not sure if you have a handout, but I'll explain the project briefly. The project will upgrade 82nd Street, which is currently a gravel road, to a two-lane paved road for two miles for a total cost of $23 million. The county has budgeted $13 million in county funds, including local option sales tax proceeds. The project will modernize the current roadway to meet the current and future traffic demands, as well as provide much needed pedestrian and bicycle connections in the area. The existing demand for this road is approximately 5,000 vehicles per day, which cannot be supported by a gravel road with severe geometric deficiencies. This demand has caused significant safety issues on 82nd Street, as well as on State Highway 5 to the north, which parallels the corridor. 82nd Street is a critical community connection that is anchored by a high school on each end, as well as a large industrial area in the city of Chaska and Chanhassen, as well as the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, which has over 500,000 annual visitors. Carver County is the fastest growing county in the state, and upgrading 82nd Street is, cr is a critical piece of our transportation network. The county, with its partners, completed a two-year two -year comprehensive study of all the transportation needs in and around the Arboretum. The study concluded that more than $200 million in infrastructure investment is needed in the area over the next 20 years. 82nd Street project is the first project needed to realize this vision as it is a direct reliever to State Highway 5, which is the transportation lifeline for the cities in this area. Highway 5 is an aging road that carries 27,000 vehicles today, today, per day, and has approximately two and a half times the average crash rate of a roadway of its type. We have a program project on Highway 5 to reconstruct a segment in 2025 and 26, and are continuing to seek more, more funding for Highway 5. However, Highway 5 will have to be closed in 2026 to construct the roadway, so it is essential that we build 82nd Street in 2025 to mitigate the severe traffic impacts to the communities and businesses in the area. We're asking the state to help fund 82nd Street with our city partners, as there is no way the cities can pay for their share of the project, given its unique location. The road is bordered by the Arboretum to the north, undeveloped property in Chassis to the south. The city has no plans to develop that property before the year 2040, so there's no development uh, fees or um, um, projects that could help fund the roadway. We thank both the House and the Senate bonding committees for touring the project in 2021. We really appreciate this committee's support of 82nd Street by including it in this year's House bonding bill for $3.8 million. The $3.8 million will allow us to complete the design and property acquisition phases of the project in 23 and 24, but we respectfully request the remaining $6.2 million in state bonding to complete construction in 2025. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing so, you no know, questions, close the comments, Representative Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to personalize this area, this is a dirt road. Um, a lot of young drivers drive it uh, to get to school. We have Chan High School on one side, Holy Family High School on another side. Um, it's quite dangerous, and it doesn't qualify for federal funding, so that is why it's a special situation, and we would uh, very much appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have House File 1796. Representative Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So today I have a bill for uh, House File 1796, and I think you might have some letters and uh, other material in your packets. Uh, this is um, for Campfire Minnesota, which used to be known as 
Camp Tanaduna. It's a, a, a beautiful place <coughs> in my district where kids for many years have gone to recreate in nature. Um, Amy Klobuchar actually, Senator Amy Klobuchar actually had um, visited this camp, had been at this camp, and my daughter was there too many years ago. Um, and I'm going to hand over um, the testimony to um, the person who's the director of Camp Fire, Minnesota. Welcome, Director. Please identify yourself and proceed. Hi, thank you. Corey Rada Penning. Um, Chairly, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of House File 1796. Um, I serve as the president and CEO at Camp Fire Minnesota. House File 1796 will provide critical funding to Camp Fire Minnesota to implement necessary infrastructure projects needed to allow a thousand more young people um, to access nature, to increase accessibility, and to maintain and improve water quality of Lake Minnewashta. Camp Fire Minnesota is an inclusive nature-based um, youth development organization located in Carver County that serves a highly diverse population of youth in the Twin Cities area. We offer a welcoming space for all to find their spark in nature through our pre-K through 12th grade environmental education program, our after-school nature programs, um, and our summer and school break camps. Um, in the 2021 academic school year, we led nature experiences for over 7,800 young people. Of the young people served at Camp Fire, 20% identify as people of color, and in our academic-based programs, 40% um, qualify for free or reduced lunch. Um, we saw in the summer of 2022 that we had over 2,600 young people on our wait list for our summer camp program. Due to infrastructure needs, we were unable to welcome these young people into nature. With a new waterfront area, bathhouse, and programming building, we will be able to expand our camp programming and welcome an additional 1,000 young people at Camp Fire. While the demand for our summer, program, summer camp program is significant, the request for our scholarships has also increased in recent years. Our private fundraising efforts are primarily focused on raising funds to provide scholarships for young people who otherwise would not be able to participate in our programming. The state funding in this bill will expand our capacity to serve more students while we continue to focus our fundraising efforts to break down the financial barriers so more students can participate. About 48% of young people participating in our programs received full or partial scholarships. Serving all students, regardless of financial means, is at the core of Camp Fire's mission. Chair and committee members, the unfortunate reality that we all know is that many Twin Cities children don't have the same access to nature um, and swimming. We all know the positive effects. You've heard some of it already today about the power of playing outside, making friends, um, and without screens. One of the best parts of my job is that I get to see kids exhausted at the end of the day because they never stop playing, running, or swimming. This bill will allow us to offer that experience to a thousand more young people a year. Camp Fires Minnesota is located on 103 acres in Carver County with waterfront access to Lake Minnewashta. So in addition to this funding, supporting more young people getting into nature, um, and it will also support efforts to manage water, water runoff into Lake Minnewashta um, to maintain and improve water quality of the lake. Um, Camp Fire will actually mark our 100th anniversary of programming at our camp property in 2024. Um, and so this funding will allow us to enter a new century with a strong commitment to ensure young people have access to nature in the decades to come. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Closing comments, Representative Reen. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, so my closing comment would be, I'd like everyone to just take a moment to imagine being in a forest of pine trees Smell the pine. Think about a lake nearby where you can hop in a canoe. And then think, there are some kids who have never experienced this, so they wouldn't be able to imagine that kind of experience. And this is a place where we're going to be able to bring more children to be able to experience the great outdoors, um, get them off screens. We have a real problem with screen addiction. And we need to be able to allow all of our kids, all of our kids in Minnesota, to be able to experience the great outdoors and nature and pine trees and the beauty of Quite honestly, Carver County. <laughs> Thank you so much for considering this. I Thank appreciate it. Thank you, Representative. It. So we're going to jump around. Uh, next on the agenda, we have Chair Zhang, House File 710. It's Chair Zhang has to run back to his committee. So go ahead, Chair Zhang. Thank you, Chair Lee. House File 710 is a uh, bill seeking an appropriation for PROCEED, which is an organization that was founded 27 years ago and has expanded its services to address the education, health, economic development needs of the St. Paul Eastside community. Additional areas that this organization helps with is employment, youth enrichment, 
uh, and community. Uh, this $6.7 million capital investment would further uh, help the community with youth uh, after school programs, <coughs> preparation courses, and a health clinic. And I have here with me today uh, a testifier who will speak more to this project. Welcome. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Robert Doty, and I am the uh, vice chair of the Proceed Inc. Uh, board of Directors. Thank you for taking the time um, to hear us today. Uh, Proceed is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that has been in existence for 25 years. Since its founding, Proceed has been actively working to support children and families on the east side of St. Paul by providing wraparound services in five distinct areas, employment, education, youth enrichment, health, and civic slash community relations. In the spirit of our mission and the work we are doing, we're asking today for a capital investment of $6.7 million to design, construct, furnish, and equip a new youth community center for the east side of St. Paul. The center will, will be owned and operated by Proceed. Our vision is that the center will support the community through youth after-school programs, college preparation courses, a robust food shelf, job training programs, and a full-service health clinic. There is a significant need for these outreach services on the east side of St. Paul. This area is dealing with many social and community concerns, including high unemployment, food insecurity, increased gang activity, low reading and math scores, and is part of a healthcare desert. The project, the project that we're talking about will consist of a 14,281 square foot facility that will house a gymnasium, a 2,500 foot square foot full service health clinic, office space, classrooms, and warehouse spacing to support the food shelf. The center will benefit the community by providing alternative education models for youth who may not normally see a path to higher education. This after school program, these after school programs will support uh, for students who not only need after hours care, but will also be staffed with capable workers who can assist with homework and other educational needs. The clinic will be in partnership with M Health and will provide needed health care to low and moderate income community members. Finally, the food shelf will continue providing health, healthy food to needy families in the community. With the exception of the clinic, much of Proceeds programming has been conducted out of Progressive Baptist Church and their church facility. The new youth community center will allow Proceeds to not only centralize activities in a separate location, but will allow the organization to expand its current programming to support more families within the community. Proceeds maintains educational programming to guide urban youth in their efforts to make good choices in the future. Proceed was founded on the premise that early intervention is the key to addressing the educational disparities between children of color and, other, and their white counterparts. Furthermore, Proceed sponsors an annual college fair and a college tour for the students and their parents. The college fair is carried out in conjunction with St. Paul Public Schools, and the college tour has successfully taken youth around the country to historically back colleges and universities for the past 15 years. Literally thousands of Twin Cities youth have, been, been, have benefited from this programming as they have been exposed to post-secondary options and given the tools to succeed. Proceeds Food Shelf has been serving food on the east side community for the past 14 years and has given out over 629,000 pounds of food. The Food Shelf serves the at-large community and has been in partnership with St. Pascal's Church, also on the east side. Proceeds sponsors, finally sponsors an annual job fair specifically targeted to individuals who may have a more difficult time finding employment due to a criminal record or low educational attainment. The job fair has been supported by several, several, several companies who have provided on-the-spot job opportunities. With that, I thank you so much and hope that, the, that there was value in our, in, in our capital investment ask and has, that is demonstrated, um, was demonstrated in our short presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Chair John, close the comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, you've heard from my testifier today about the need for uh, this institution to have its own facility during a pandemic you know we all of our communities were hurt uh, and because of this institution they were able to help out many who were in need and so with this funding we can ensure that proceed has 
the facility to continue serving the needs of the community in my district. And I would uh, urge that uh, um, members uh, support this bill and uh, fund it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Next on the agenda, Representative Curran, House File 1798. Welcome, Representative. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Committee. Um, I am pleased today to present House File 1798. It is a uh, $5 million request by Ramsey County for Phase 1 of the extension of the Bruce Vento Trail. Uh, the county brought this bill to me as part of the um, project resides in my district and is actually uh, only one small city in my district that this does not impact. So. Um, I'll, I'll say that the Bruce Vento Regional Trail is a 13-mile community treasure. It extends from the east side of downtown St. Paul to the North County Line in White Bear Township. The southern seven-mile segment of the Regional Trail was completed in 2005 from downtown St. Paul to Berkeley Road and White Bear Lake on the former Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway. Uh, this house file asked for $5 million to complete the next phase, which is known as Phase 1. The project constructs a 2.7 mile extension of the trail between Berkeley Road and the intersection of Hoffman and Highway 61 in White Bear Lake. Um, and I'll note um, from personal experience, of course, this goes right through the middle of my, of my district. And uh, historically, this can be um, a dangerous and has been deadly uh, space for pedestrians and cyclists at times. Um, so it's crucial that we get uh, this, this trail, um, that we get this trail extended through that area. Um, it runs through uh, Gem Lake, White Bear Lake, White Bear Township, and Badness Heights. Um, significant access barriers will be eliminated from industrial areas and major vehicular transportation routes, providing a new multimodal uh, trail. Um, it's been long sought after. This connection will provide other um, popular uh, regional and local trails. It'll connect those, um, connect people with popular destinations. Uh, the Lake Links Regional Trail, Gateway Regional Trail, and the planned South Shore Trail, and future connection proposed to the Hardwood Creek Regional Trail uh, in Washington County at County Road J. Uh, in addition, the trail will connect populations near the southern St. Paul segment of the existing Bruce Vento Trail, which extends through highly urban and concentrated areas of poverty, making it a regionally important connection that will directly benefit diverse populations. Uh, today I have with me Ramsey County Commissioner Victoria Reinhart to offer a few words on the bill and we also have a county staffer here uh, if there are any questions. Um, I know you have a full agenda and I appreciate the time today and I'll turn it over. Welcome Commissioner, please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, my name is Victoria Reinhart. I'm Ramsey County Commissioner. I represent District 7, which includes all of the city of White Bear Lake, all of Maplewood and all of North St. Paul. Um, I am really pleased to be here today. Uh, this funding completes approximately three miles of the six mile gap in this popular regional and national trail system. The total cost is 10 million, of which we already have 5 million committed from the county and federal resources. This will eliminate several barriers and provides north-south multi-use trail and pedestrian facilities in an area that does not have facilities today. It connects two areas, both with racially diverse pop populations and poverty, with substantial concentrations of youth, elderly, and residents with disabilities for increased access to multimodal transportation facilities. It provides connections to other well-used, well-loved local and regional trail systems, as mentioned by Representative Corin. It reduces the crashes of conflicts of, uh, between ped, bike, and uh, vehicles and it increases access to multimodal transportation facilities, schools, places of work, shopping, and local regional park and trail facilities. Thank you again, Chair Lee and members of the committee, and I would stand for any questions, and do have a staff person, Scott Yonke, here if you have questions about the design. Closing comments. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just uh, I, I thank you for consideration. Thank the committee for consideration. This is an important addition to our community. Um, it's a safer way to, to travel, and I, I look forward to um, look forward to hopefully seeing this in the final bill. Thank you. Thank you. And then, Representative Curran, you're going to present the two bills for Representative Kozlowski. That's correct. First up, House File 1196. All right. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I will be uh, pinch hitting for Representative Kozlowski today. Um, we have testifiers uh, for their bills um, 
that will be remote. Um, House file 1196 is, is for the St. Louis County Depot. It's a project which uh, we already helped fund in the 2020 bonding bill. Um, specifically, uh, we, fund, we funded the phase one of the rehabilitation of the depot. Uh, the county matched the dollars of $1.5 million uh, for the exterior building improvements. Um, a new roof, tuck pointing, and rehab of the portico of this historic and iconic building were all done. The good news is that all of phase one work is now completed and the county is ready to move on to phase two of the project. Uh, together, now it's time to finish what we started, move on to the final phase, phase two of this project, and all of the interior, interior reservation, uh, renovations that are needed uh, to update this 1892 era building. Uh, with us today is the director of the SLC Depot, Mary Tennis. Uh, she will describe for you uh, the specific interior work that is needed to finally complete the project. Director Tennis, thank you for your patience. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee, members of the committee. Thank you, Representative. Uh, my name is Mary Tennis, and I am the director of the St. Louis County Heritage and Arts Center. Our building, the St. Louis County Heritage and Arts Center, was originally constructed in 1892 as a train depot to serve our community with transportation, services, and immigrant workers looking for opportunities in the north. In fact, that's where I'm sitting right now, in the immigrant waiting room, a place where immigrants arriving to Minnesota would wait for community partners to connect them with work, rooming, and other services in the area. In 1977, a new vision was created for the building, with big ambitions and support from the community, an arts and cultural center. With participation from organizations like the Duluth Junior League, a need was identified and new connections were established between the public and the area's premier arts and cultural organizations. In 2019, my position was created through St. Louis County and I helped cultivate a renewed United mission and vision for our building that balanced healthy tenant partnerships and a healthy building. In 2020, as the building rode the waves of the pandemic and social justice change, we made the big decision to eliminate our entrance fee and welcome more of our public to our exhibits, our events, and activities. Teaming up with public health, we even served as a site for the first wave of COVID-19 vaccinations welcoming first responders, healthcare workers, and educators to our trusty old building during a very uncertain time. We are now a free resource for incredible programs like Girl Power, Bold Choice Theater, the BIPOC Business Showcase, Every Child Ready, and many other wonderful community partners who offer programs to underserved populations and beyond here in the North. We are repurposed as a community resource that works broadly with regional partners, including 4-H and the public library, who benefit from a large, centrally located and beautiful venue. We still offer space for key tenant partners who benefit from subsidized rents and in turn are able to offer free and reduced costs for their programming to more folks who deserve to participate in arts and cultural adventures. We are dedicated to connecting culture with community. In 2020, we received 1.5 million through the bonding bill, thanks to the state support. And we put it really to good use. We have a brand new roof over our performing arts wing. Our historic portico has been re-roofed and structurally reinforced. And we are currently uh, engaged in a huge life safety upgrade. But we need to cross the finish line for a comfortable, dependable building for our partners and our public. We are requesting 4.658 million with a county match to get this project done. Gratefully, we did make Governor Waltz's list for bonding on this project. The building is in the final phase of crucial system upgrades and currently in the process of an HVAC study, slated to wrap up at the end of March with sustainability and longevity as the focal points. This study ensures that should we receive funding, we, we will be shovel ready for a significant holistic HVAC upgrade throughout our over 100,000 square feet of space. Many of our mechanical systems are on their last legs, barely operational, and each added success of an event or program is a strain on an overtaxed waning equipment. Along with this project, we plan to address remaining life safety and envelope integrity concerns that dovetail in with mechanical, electrical, and plumbing upgrades. We've made such great progress with our identity as a place and as a resource, 
and we really must make it across the finish line to ensure the future of a healthy, vibrant building. With more connections and partnerships on the horizon, now really is the time to make these upgrades. Thank you so much. Thank you. Representative Scraba. Thank you, uh, Mary. Hear me okay? Um, yeah. Do you know if the, um, uh, a county built uh, on iron past present and uh, challenges the future, is that going to be in the depot part? Is it, is it part of this too, or is it a separate? Because I know I have a bill for it separately. Director Titus. Sure, um, great question. So th that is separate, although um, you know these upgrades directly affect that exhibit and all other exhibits. I'm actually adjacent, I can see the county built on iron uh, site from where I'm sitting right now. Good. Uh, th th thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and and thank you for stepping in. Uh, it's it's a good building. It, it's an icon for downtown Duluth. Uh, every little bit can help. It helps a lot. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Scraba. Close the comments. Uh, no, th thank you for the for the time and uh, consideration of this project. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next on the agenda, House File Seven Seven Four, Representative Curran. Thank you again, Chair and Committee. Um, again, this is a Representative Kozlowski bill, and I had the uh, very fortunate experience of hearing this bill in the Judiciary Committee. Um, wonderful program that we're talking about here that provides funds to First Witness um, for the purchase and renovation of a larger building for their Child Advocacy Center. It is a uh, nationally recognized training center. First Witness has a bold vision that we can all get behind, a vision of a society that supports children and puts an end to child abuse. Um, the former president of the American Academy of Pediatrics said adverse childhood experiences are the single greatest unaddressed public health threat we're facing in our nation today. First Witness Child Advocacy Center is a child-focused nonprofit agency. They offer hope, healing, and justice for alleged victims of child abuse and for their families. Uh, we're bringing this, for this bill forward because since its inception nearly 30 years ago, First Witness has grown in both number of children served and services provided as a response to cases of alleged child abuse. They also partner with their community to offer a robust and comprehensive child abuse prevention program, and they serve the entire state uh, with their nationally recognized training in child-focused forensic interviewing and family advocacy. 10 years ago, they served 70 children annually. Last year, they served 220 children uh, providing child-friendly, legally defensible forensic interviews, intensive ongoing advocacy, mental health services, and uh, medical exams. They also facilitate a multidisciplinary team approach when working with uh, law, local law enforcement, child protection services, and attorneys to accomplish the best outcome uh, for victims of child abuse. And we have a virtual testifier. I'd like to turn it over. Thank you. Uh, Welcome. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee and members of the House Capital Investment Committee and also Representative Karan for stepping in today. My name is Tracy Klana and I'm the Executive Director of First Witness Child Advocacy Center. I am honored to be here today to talk to you about our work and HF 774. According to the CDC, one in seven girls, one in 13 boys, and one in four non-binary youth in the U.S. will experience child sexual abuse before the age of 18. Every child has the fundamental right to be safe, to be treated with dignity, to be cared for, and to thrive in their community. Child abuse robs a, chi a child of these fundamental rights. We as communities need to provide safety and justice to all children. First Witness is dedicated to the children and families in our community. We offer a comprehensive and holistic child advocacy center to help those in need of our services. As you can see in our summary, our impact continues to climb both in numbers and in services. We now serve Carleton County, the Fond du Lac Tribe, Lake County, St. Louis County, and Cook County. First Witness sees our role in disrupting the cycle of violence and building safety both on the individual and on the community level. Our team of professionally trained forensic interviewers protect child victims with safe evidence-based techniques. Our family advocates build connections across systems to represent families' needs. 
Our prevention educators spend time in classrooms empowering children around safety strategies and freedom from self-blame. They train teachers and parents both on prevention and appropriate response. 30 years ago, our center was built to serve as a place for child-friendly forensic interviews. Since our beginnings, First Witness has expanded our efforts both in numbers and services. This increase has led us to desperately need a new and larger building. This new building will include child and teen centered spaces, space for ongoing advocacy services, a medical exam room, an additional forensic interview room, a multidisciplinary team space that allows for law enforcement and social services to truly respond to the needs of these difficult cases. Our justice system is one of authoritative and is set up to have respect and reverence for the law. This doesn't work well for a child to talk about their trauma freely and openly. It is important also for us to have a neutrally, neutral and legally defensible interview. This requires us to be privately owned and independent from our investigative and prosecuting partners. Finally, our new building includes a training center, a training center that the state of Minnesota can be proud of, that will bring investigators and advocates from around the state and around the country to learn from our national model. The course of child abuse investigation is very challenging to navigate. To address this, we offer a child advocacy center that provides effective prevention, intervention, and systems change. Thank you for your consideration of this bill, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Close the comments. Thank you, Chair, and again, thank you, committee. And <clears throat> I'll just say that this is a capital investment um, bill here today, but it goes much, much farther beyond um, just a capital investment. Um, this is a program that has literally worked so well that it has outgrown the space that it's in. It benefits Minnesotans across the state. This gives uh, children who've been through very traumatic events um, a comfortable space where they can speak freely about what has happened to them. And in turn, that can help us um, increase our efforts in justice where we can make sure that uh, perpetrators are, are sought and held to that um, and held accountable. So I, again, thank the committee for this. Um, I strongly encourage support for this project. It's a, not just a matter of capital investment, but also a matter of public safety. Thank you. Thank you again. Next on the agenda, we have Chair Hassan, House File 458. Welcome, Chair. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, for the opportunity to present House File uh, 458, which is phase two funding for Avivo Regional Center, uh, Career and Employment um, Center. Thank you for all the returning members who have visited Avivo in the past. And I um, invite new members to come and visit. Hopefully the chair will be gracious enough to make a stop at Avivo. Um, Avivo is a nonprofit organization that increases the well-being of individuals uh, by pairing chemical and mental health services with career training and employment services to help them achieve recovery, employment, and career advancement. Uh, with Hennepin County as their fiscal sponsor, Avivo is asking uh, 25 million for phase two funding to support the renovation and expansion of its regional recovery, employment, and career education center in Minneapolis. With that, Mr. Chair, I have the executive director of Avivo, Kelly Manor, who will just uh, walk us through what this funding is for. Welcome, Director. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Kelly Matter, and I'm the president and CEO of Avivo. Avivo serves 13,000 individuals and families each year. We are on the front lines of the crises, the major crises affecting our state, the opioid epidemic, the crisis of unsheltered homelessness, and the labor shortage uh, we are experiencing as employers. Um, sincere thanks to Representative uh, Hassan, who has been a champion of Avivo for a long time now. Um, thanks to all of you who have toured our campus, and I invite any and all of you to join us. Um, thanks also for supporting phase one of our work. We did really good work over the last couple of years uh, with the planning and design um, to meet the needs of our community, our community who's struggling uh, more than ever right now. Um, 
We are also grateful to be part of the gover governor's uh, recommendations and as always, thankful for the incredible partnership we, uh, we have with Hennepin County where we are providing many of these crucial services. I wanna talk specifically about the needs of this um, aging building and the infrastructure that goes around, along with that, but I wanna share just a few of the outcomes that we achieve on this campus. So in 2022, a year um, that was one of the most difficult years for individuals struggling with substance use, mental health, and unsheltered homelessness, we had 6,000 men, women, families enter our treatment programs for substance use um, and mental health at a time when you know, uh, supporting families with housing and recovery um, in their darkest hours. Avivo Village, which is uh, the first of its kind in the country, indoor tiny home emergency, low barrier emergency shelter, has moved 130 people who were sleeping outside into emergency shelter and then into permanent housing. In total, we supported over 1,600 individuals move from um, living outside unsheltered to permanent housing. Uh, we were able to increase more than triple uh, wages by individuals we served in our employment and career training programs with the average wages being a right around 29,000 annually. And we helped 1,500 people secure jobs last year with over 80% retaining those jobs at six months. And we assisted over 1,200 families move off of public assistance permanently into a better quality of life for them and their children. We believe deeply in the dignity of all people and we're committed to achieving excellence and outcomes. And our current facility built in 1960 does not allow us to maintain the dignity of the individuals we serve. In fact, it stands in the way of our ability to achieve strong outcomes. And honestly, it's starting to stand in the way of us being able to provide services at all. I was reminded of this yesterday. I, um, I blocked it out of my mind, but I'm part of a not-for-profit CEO group that gets together about every eight weeks. So we were hosting at Urban Ventures yesterday, and they reminded me that our last meeting was held at Avivo when uh, the city of Minneapolis had shut the water off, and when they turned it back on, our pipes couldn't withstand it, and it started raining on all of us in our boardroom. And it was raining from the restrooms above us. Um, so I blocked it out of my mind. They, uh, jokingly reminded me of uh, the needs that we have at Avivo. Um, I know that the number for phase two of this project is a large number, um, but we are at real risk, risk with the age of our building. The price of our project did double um, in the last two years because of escalation or inflation or whatever it is being called. We've been able to work to bring that number down, but it's still at a much increased rate. I assure you we are um, audited and uh, monitored uh, by an outside independent auditor, and we have the state and the city and the county in our building most weeks doing a monitoring and auditing. auditing. We serve thousands of individuals out of this space, not in decades, but every single year. Individuals that have uh, significant barriers exacerbated in the last three years. The need for our services were growing at about a 40% rate prior to the pandemic and all that has occurred in our community. And now our the need for our services is as much beyond our ability to serve. This programming space is inadequate. Our hope is to double the size of our space to meet the needs of our communities and also consolidate um, some of our programming. The Vivo Institute for Career and Technical Education will move on site to allow us to continue to provide even more holistic services in one, in one location. Your support is critical. It also allow us to raise the additional, do the additional fundraising to support this, um, this project to continue uh, to commit to the most pressing needs in our community, the opioid epidemic, unsheltered homelessness, and meeting the needs of uh, our Minnesota employers uh, collaboratively. Thank you, Chair Lee and members of the committee. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Close the comments, Chair Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a great project. Please support uh, this House uh, file, and hopefully we will be in the final bill. Thank you. Next on the agenda, House File 1208, Representative Bonner. Welcome, Representative Bonner. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Appreciate the time today. And I actually am grateful that uh, Representative Hassan went before me. It gave me a little time to catch my breath from running through the tunnel. Uh, so thank you for that. 
Representative. Um, the Maple Grove Community Center, uh, or Maple Grove is a thriving community uh, with a plethora of things to, going for it, including the community center that serves as the go-to place for seniors and pickleball, aqua aerobics and splashdown, uh, uh, the Grove <coughs> Cove uh, water slide, from basketball to birthday parties, banquets to bustling conferences, and sports tournaments to weddings. While the area population has grown by a robust 28% in the past 25 years um, since the community center opened, its visitors have become as diverse as the wide array of people it serves. Uh, from toddlers and teens to sports enthusiasts and seniors. As the services of the Maple Grove Community Center have grown, so have the communities it serves. Increasingly, we see the Maple Grove Community Center becoming a gathering space for about 650,000 visitors annually from around the region. Um, the ever-growing needs of the surrounding community have fueled the need to expand and renovate to meet the vision of the future. The expansion and renovation will include critical cost-saving measures to install energy-efficient systems while renovating existing banquet and meeting space. Uh, the expanding aquatic and athletic spaces as well. It will serve the needs of an age-friendly Maple Grove uh, through greater services to seniors and meet citizens where they are. By expanding access to food and housing supports for the community, the changing needs of our community and our region are met by this microcosm of diverse community. Um, sorry. Uh, members, we thank you for your time and consideration and hope you will consider this important regional investment in our uh, Northwest communities. And I ask for your support of House File 1208. And with that, Mr. Chair, I have beside me uh, Mayor Mark Stephenson uh, from Maple Grove and our city administrator, <laughs> in the course, sorry, <laughs> available for questions. Welcome, Mayor. Please identify yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Lee. Hello, I am Mark Stephenson. I'm the mayor of Maple Grove, and I want to extend my appreciation to Chair Lee uh, for the opportunity to testify today about this important project for Maple Grove. I want to thank and extend our appreciation uh, to be included in the 2021 bonding tour. We are grateful to host the House Capital Investment Committee at the Community Center at that time. We appreciate the bipartisan support of our Maple Grove legislators who have authored this bill, Representative Bonner, Representative Robbins, and Representative Carroll as well as the support we received from the governor's office on this regional asset being included in the 2022 governor's bonding bill and in this year's governor's recommendations for bonding. The Maple Grove Community Center opened to the public in 1997. For over 25 years, it has served the heart of our community, the heart of our region, uh, welcoming over 650,000 visitors annually. The wear and tear on this facility over the past 25 years and additionally to the population growth we have experienced has really taken a toll on the facility. We are serving a much more diverse community today. Uh, over 56% of the students in the Osceola School District are uh, of students of color. The proposed project includes partners that will be a part of our project that include veteran services and the nonprofit Cross Services, which provides food, housing, and social services to the region. A goal of this project also will be to reduce the current carbon footprint of the facility, ensuring energy efficient and green construction principles throughout the expansion. This aligns with other recent projects initiated by our city for solar, geothermal, and other energy efficient projects. We are requesting $22.5 million for this $125 million project to expand and revitalize our facility so we can continue to serve the significant growth in our region to serve the visitors and the residents of the Northwest communities and those throughout the state who visit us every year. We ask for your support and reinvestment in this regional asset and thank you for the time today. Thank you, Mayor. Closing comments, Representative Bonner. 
Uh, you know, really, I just want to emphasize the fact that this facility is the home, uh, sort of a, a regional gathering place. Um, you, I know many of the folks, including some in this room, have visited our community center for all types of occasions and activities. Um, it really is a hub of the community for, for young and old. And so uh, being able to revitalize that space and continue to use it with the growing, expanding communities around us uh, for for youth, for, for children, and for our seniors is really important. So uh, we look forward to um, hearing from you and hope to have your support. Thank you, Representative Bonner. Next on the agenda, Representative Hill, House File 1545. Welcome again, uh, Representative Hill, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee and members of the committee and happy St. Patrick's Day. I saw on the agenda that uh, my associate, Mr. Ryan Collins and I were last on your list and uh, we don't wanna stand between you and sunny weekend and uh, certainly not a St. Patrick's Day celebration, but it looks like we might have a few more coming up after us here. Today we're coming before you to seek an appropriation to help support the newly founded and hopefully soon to be completed Washington County Heritage Center, which is located in Stillwater, Minnesota. As many of you know, Stillwater has been dubbed the birthplace of Minnesota. And the reason for that is 175 years ago today, um, plans were put forth to hold the Minnesota Territorial Convention on the corner of Main Street and Myrtle Street in Stillwater. And the importance of the Heritage Center in Stillwater is that it's a place that can uh, collect, that can store, and that can display our, our artifacts that tell the story of uh, the inception of, of Minnesota as a territory and, and soon after that a state. Washington County Heritage Center is committed to sharing the rich history through the storage of these artifacts and to put them on displays for all to see. With me today is Mr. Ryan Collins, who serves as the Vice President of the Stillwater, His or excuse me, Washington County Historical Society, and he's played a critical central role in getting the Heritage Center to where it is today, and I'd like to turn it over to him to share his vision for the final phase of the, of the Please project. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members, and Representative Hill for authoring this bill. Thank you also to Representatives Lilly and Anderson for signing on. My name is Ryan Collins. I'm a middle school educator, a city council member in Stillwater, and the Vice President for the Board of Directors of the Washington County Historical Society. I'm excited and thankful to be here today to tell you about the Washington County Heritage Center. Washington County is the gateway to Minnesota, offering a shared history with all Minnesotans. The land that is now Washington County has a story to tell. From the Dakota Oyate, the Anishinaabe, and those from Europe, Africa, Central America, and Asia. One day, our own story, as well as the story of future generations, will also be a part of this legacy. History doesn't just come from textbooks. Artifacts provide meaningful interaction with the past. In October 2021, the Washington County Heritage Center opened a 12,000 square foot space with exhibit galleries, a research center, and an education space that is bigger than my middle school classroom. Our galleries include exquisite Native American beadwork from the Ojibwe, Black baseball in Minnesota highlighting Bud Fowler, who played in Stillwater in 1884 and was recently elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, also, early photography, fashion, pioneer life, the lumber industry of the late 19th and early 20th century, and our soon-to-open grocery exhibit, which of course will cover the emergence of Cub Foods. We are now moving beyond our first phase, and we are asking for your help. Preservation of artifacts is a vital part of this process, and we are seeking the space and equipment to properly do that. When an item is donated to our organization, it is expected that we will preserve it in perpetuity. Our current storage space, located on the property of the Warden's House Museum, the surviving remnant of the territorial prison, is full. We simply have no more available storage. While phase two may not be as flashy as the first, it is the most important for our mission of preserving, promoting, and disseminating the history of Washington County. We worked with the Minnesota Historical Society to ensure that our plans meet proper preservation standards. Our storage area will be 4,000 square feet and will cost approximately $1.2 million, half of which would be matched. Our roof insulation must increase from 3 inches to 10 inches, which is the industry standard for appropriate insulation. Also included are movable shelving, 
proper storage cabinets, which are the same as the Minnesota Historical Society uses in their archives, and eight new HVAC units on the roof to provide adequate temperature and humidity control, which is essential to proper preservation. As an educator, I understand the importance of ensuring that history includes all voices, especially those that have been underrepresented in the past. We have a shared legacy as Minnesotans, a legacy that begins with the Dakota and Ojibwe, the original inhabitants, to you and I and those who will come after us. On behalf of the Washington County Historical Society, we ask for your support of HF 1545 so we may continue to provide this for future generations to come. This appropriation will mean so much to our organization and the people who live in and visit Washington County. Thank you. Thank you, council members. I really appreciate your remarks uh, talking about legacy. And so since we have the chair of legacy here, uh, Representative Hill, have you considered seeking funding from the legacy committee for this project? No, but we would uh, be willing to uh, partner with anyone and everyone who wants to uh, to see this project move forward. So we would be happy to to make that connection. Thank you, Representative Hill. Representative Carroll. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I thought you, I saw you waving down to ask a question. No. Oh, that was for the previous testimony. Okay. And Apologize. I was going to comment about that project. But okay. I caught him in the hall. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Closing comments. No, once again, I, I'd just like to reflect on that, that image of uh, folks gathering 175 years ago. Uh, and it was in that convention where it was uh, decided upon to, uh, to title the territory that we find ourselves in, Minnesota. And so as we look forward, uh, we ask for your support in this opportunity to provide a, a place and a space for people to, uh, to come to and learn about that legacy and see these artifacts. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hill. Last bill on the agenda, Chair Hanson, House File 126. Welcome, Chair Hanson. Please proceed. I want to thank the members of the committee that are here for staying. It's our job, right? House File 126 is capital improvements for the Doug Woog arena. I thought the one person who skates at the arena was going to leave, uh, Representative Lilly, but uh, you're staying, so thank you. Uh, this is 800000 from the bond proceeds fund to the Commissioner of Deed for a grant uh, for uh, capital projects uh, to design, construct, and equip improvements and betterments of capital nature. And I have with me the Mayor of South St. Paul uh, for the last meeting of the day, and you know, I started the day with the, a meeting at 8 o'clock in City Hall, so we're bookending the day on St. Patrick's Day, and he wore the green, but I forgot this morning. So uh, with that, I'll have the mayor uh, talk about the project. Welcome, Mayor. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee and members. Uh, Jimmy Francis, Mayor of South St. Paul. Um, you have it before you what, what our ask is, and I just would say uh, we humbly ask uh, for your support in this. We are good stewards of funds that have been given to us in the past. Uh, just to, to reiterate the fact that uh, we've used our, not only used the funds well, but also take care and maintain those items. Uh, since I've become mayor, we've uh, created an infrastructure fund that will help us be able to uh, do these projects on our own in the future. Uh, but we need some help to get that boosted. So that's what we're here for, and, and we humbly ask for your support. Thank you. What was the comments, Chair Hanson? I'd appreciate your consideration if you could include uh, this small ask. Thank you, Chair Hanson. Uh, members, before we adjourn for today, we do have the minute, minutes to adopt. Representative Scraba, can I have a motion to approve the minutes? So Representative Scraba moves the minutes, approval of the minutes for March 15th. Any discussion? Hear none. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those say nay. The motion to be to the minutes are approved. Members, that ends our agenda for today. Really appreciate all of you uh, sticking around to hear all these bills as we uh, move forward towards consideration of a potential bill. Uh, our next hearing is on Monday, March 20th. We will continue to hear bills on an informational-only basis. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>